Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, April 6, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahomza, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Mr. Mahomza. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's hybrid Board of Education meeting is being held both virtually and in person by board members and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live and BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity, Channel 73, Verizon Files, and Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the April 6th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additional, excuse me, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I think um, there was a request from one of our board members. Is there, um, is there a change to the agenda from a board member? Yes, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Hen. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you, good evening. I move that the board add a standing agenda item as the first item of new business to the current open session agenda and all future open session agendas until further notice to discuss student performance and academic achievement. Second, Mac. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Hen, could you please put that motion in the chat? Yes, ma'am, it is in the chat. I'm not seeing it in the chat. I apologize. No worries. I will. It may have gone in before I logged in, so therefore it looks like it's not showing up. Um, and yes, if it's if you could please thank you, and then that way I can um, okay. properly restate it. Thank you. It is there. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, so Ms. Hen made a motion that the board add a standing agenda item as the first item of new business to the current open session agenda and all future open session agendas until further notice to discuss student performance and academic achievement. And um, Ms. Hen's motion was seconded by, was that Ms. Mack? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Mack. Um, and um, any any comments? Um, actually, I would like to make one, or I have a question. Um, my question is, is that I understand that Dr. Williams is currently addressing that already. And Dr. Williams, I wanted to know, is that a correct understanding? Is this what Ms. Hen's motion is? Is that something that's currently being addressed through the reopening? Yes. When that um, request was brought to my attention, I recommended that we could incorporate student performance and student achievement in our standing agenda item under reopening. 
Um, again, I know this is very important for our board. I know that we've drafted some board goals. I will be happy to share some of that tonight. I know that as a system, we have been looking at our student performance even last year, my first year. And so I think with the requests, we could map out some kind of schedule when data is available um, to present information about how our students are performing. Uh, we can also look at our current committee meetings as well. Um, that's related to student achievement or student performance. And so um, that was my uh, recommendation um, regarding an agenda item that we can incorporate and we can utilize future meetings as well as map them out for the year. I also request that we look at um, our upcoming retreat, whenever that may be during the summer, to really map out not only the, the business aspect of the work of the board in terms of the governing and budget, but also looking at student achievement particularly when data is available and that we've had an opportunity as a system, especially our staff to, to analyze and provide some recommendations. So that's, those are my comments. Thank you for that. I'm going to go in order. It looks like we had next, Ms. Rowe. Yes, Ms. Scott, I believe the maker of the motion speaks to their motion before commenters. I thought Ms. Hen already spoke to her motion. Ms. Oh, I just... Ms. Hen, did you not speak to your motion already? I did not, Madam Chair. Okay, please speak to your motion. Thank you. I appreciate Dr. Williams offering to address student performance and academic achievement um, under the reopening agenda item. However, I see these as two separate items. And by requesting that it be made a permanent agenda item, this supersedes the reopening. We need to discuss this first and foremost at every single board meeting. It is the school system's primary job to educate our children, and it should be a standing agenda item long after our buildings have reopened. So therefore, I request that the board um, support my motion and um, go on record as stating that this is our number one priority. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. <clears throat> I agree with making this a standing agenda item, particularly because the student achievement and academic progress of our students is our primary core mission of the school system. It's what we exist for. And we have heard from the NAACP mm -hmm. with over having um, this issue be front and center. We've gotten a lot of complaints and feedback that the public doesn't hear enough talk about academic achievement. And in looking at data, I've been very concerned for a very long time at the reading and math scores of our students, and I think that we do need to talk about this, and I think we need to talk about it at every meeting because we need to um, have a school system that educates children. And if we are graduating students that go to community college and need remedial math and reading instruction, that's a very big problem. Thank you. Ms. Pasteur? Uh, thank you. Uh, I um, say bravo to the notion of speaking about academic achievement. That certainly is the conversation uh, for the board that is long overdue. I think that um, I agree with, no, I know I agree with Dr. Williams, however, that we have um, the reopening. Reopening and academic achievement are not two different things because what our parents are asking um, are questions about what we're going to do with those who need reteaching, who need um, uh, recovery, who need review, acceleration. Uh, we have heard from various stakeholders about what we should be doing in the summer. And all of those things come right to re-entry. I know that in terms of re-entry, we are essentially there now. But we also have constituents, parents, who are asking questions about how many days or what happens to children with 504s, IEPs, and who've been in self-contained. This kind of robust conversation under re-entry will give us some opportunities to talk about uh, how we might use those Wednesdays or how our days look, how we are forming robust 
um, um, uh, programs for those children who are still at home and those children who are in school. And then certainly, as it has been said, we formed goals. Our committee has fabulous goals. And if you don't think formed fabulous goals, if you don't think they're good and about academic achievement, look at them. They are timelined oriented. And I'm sure the um, staff will come up with other things. We now have the uh, core instructional team, which is looking at those schools that need extra help. We have them in place. What we need is rigor and not impose okay, conversations. Okay, time. Board Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to dovetail my comments with all of uh, the previous board members. I agree with Cheryl about the importance and also about the connection to reopening. Um, and I do appreciate uh, Dr. Williams having the uh, report uh, loaded to board docs this afternoon um, and uh, ready to uh, present that and discuss that. But I think it's so important that um, and there's enough of the reopening issues in and of themselves that uh, they should be separate. So I'm going to support this motion, and um, I look forward to hearing um, all of the good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next, Ms. Mack. Yes, um, I fully support this motion. I'm only sorry that I didn't make it myself. Since I've been on the board, I have been asking about academic achievement. Every time we ask for agenda items, I ask for academic achievement. I think it is important enough that it um, has its own place on every agenda. And um, I, I had submitted a list of topics, and Ms. Pasteur is correct. We did get some of those, many of those topics in the board goals, but it is imperative as a school system that we, t you, you can't know where you're going unless you acknowledge where you are. And I think we need to talk about where we are and what we're going to do to get to where we need to be. And I think that needs to start immediately, and it needs to be every month. So thank you, Ms. Hen, for making this motion. Next, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. <clears throat> um, I would like to move the question. Second. The question Second. was moved by Mr. Kuhn, seconded by... Ms. Causey? Um, I didn't hear who was the second. Yes, Madam Chair, Ms. Causey. Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote on moving the question. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joves? No. Ms. Well, Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is seven. Does that require uh, to add a standing agenda item? Does it require two thirds or seven votes? Mr. Persedes? To vote to call the vote. Excuse me, Mr. Persedes? Yes, Ms. Scott, to, to call the vote requires a two-third majority. So that did not receive a two-third majority. Okay, thank you for that. I meant to call the vote. So that did not receive a two-third majority? Mr. Persedes? Okay, so that did not receive a two-third majority. So then debate can continue. Dr. Hager? Um, my comment was very brief. Um, I just was going to say that I feel like this this shouldn't be an either or situation. And clearly, any discussion around academics right now will be about reopening, and so they could easily be side by side on the agenda. Um, but by making this motion after things return to normal, which we're all hoping will happen, then it will remain as a as a standing agenda item. And that's why I support it because for all the reasons everyone else said too. But it doesn't seem like it should be an either or situation. That just that they can both go together pretty easily. That's all. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pastor, you have, an, you have a question? Well, no, I really should have written comment. Um, and uh, Dr. Hager just said it. It's not an either or. And I want what I said to be very clear. My issue with the motion is that I think it should be 
integral with reentry because talking about academic achievement now is about what's going to happen to our children in the next few weeks, couple of months, and what happens in the summer. You can't separate that from reentry. We need to lump them together to make sure our children are getting the very best. And then once we actually reopen, hoping that things change, that we are then taking a look at how we do all the things about which Ms. Mack has already spoken. I'm holding up the nifty driven by data. If you can look at my book, you see dog ears and marks. That is where we need to be. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Right Pastor, now, you've exceeded your time. The, this time. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. I, I, did, I had not recognized that. Um, um, Ms. Pastor, it looks like it says you had exceeded oh, your I time. See. Mr. Mercedes okay. said Thank that. You. Um, if I, I could just speak I and um, and then I'll see who has signed in to speak next. Um, my concern with this is that academic achievement is something that we as a board should be discussing all the time. I think that it's, it's a sad state of affairs that we have to have an agenda item to discuss academic achievement for the Board of Education when that should be in interwoven with everything that we say, every question we ask, everything that we do. And the fact that we have to add it as an agenda item means that that's not happening. And I think we need to look at ourselves as a board as board members. I heard the comments from our public, as Ms. Rose said, um, the NAACP, and it seemed like their comments were more so targeted at as us as board members. The questions we are asking, the suggestions that we are not making, the direction that we are not giving, that we are more... Um, uh, playing more towards ourselves and personalities and being argumentative and cutting across one another as opposed to as a board focusing on academic achievement. It's OK to ask the questions, but then once you ask the questions, what are you doing with the information that you receive? What are you doing with the data that you receive? You want more uh, increases in teachers in the classroom. So what are you doing to make that happen? How are you working to um, have academic achievement for our students other than just asking a question about it and then being critical of the question? So I think that is what we as board members need to keep that in mind. Um, but I think it is a sad state of affairs that we have to add this as an agenda item because it should be interwoven in everything that we do in all of our committees. There's a curriculum committee and Dr. Williams is going to give us a presentation. So I think that this um, motion is, is rather redundant. Uh, looks like we have a few more, okay, uh, questions. Is there anyone we've not heard from? Because I want to make sure I get to everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going in order. It looks like it's um, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I agree with what's being said. We need to discuss this first and foremost at every meeting, and we have to be intentional about it. If it doesn't get on the agenda as its own item, we are not intentional, and we are not doing the work of the board. Um, as everyone has said, it, it's been too long. We need to be intentional, and we need to add it as a standing item, as important, if not it's more important than anything else on our agenda. And by not giving it a placeholder, we are doing a disservice to every student in our system. It's time we add it as an agenda item, get it on, have a permanent placeholder for it, and we get into it. Whether that's discussing issues around the reopening or not, we will be reopened. That will come off the agenda. This needs its permanent place where it belongs, prominently at the focus of every single board meeting. Thank you. Next, it looks like we have Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just briefly, I did want to reiterate that it is the priority of the board, and this is the way the board uh, drives conversation, uh, comes up with ideas, has staff uh, bring to us what they are seeing, and also it's an opportunity for the committees um, to bring forward what they are doing related to achievement. And we know that the Equity Committee has been doing a lot of work uh, around that and the curriculum committee as well. And this is uh, a placeholder every meeting where all of these different pieces can come together, come to the board uh, for that high level conversation and discussion where we can see the trends. Dr. Williams can uh, reveal that to us, but also he can bring recommendations uh, for the board's um, not necessarily approval. Some recommendations will need approval, but some recommendations are for our edification and for the public to understand that this is the core mission and we're working hard to achieve it for each and every child in the system. 
Ms. Rowe? I think it's important for the public and everyone to realize from a parliamentary standpoint, the Board of Education and the members can only talk about a topic as it is pertained to the agenda. And just like equity is embedded in everything we do, and yet we still need equity presentations and equity committees, academic achievement goes right hand in hand with equity. And even though it's embedded, we have to talk about it. Because if we're not going to talk about it, we can't talk about the issues on the agenda in two minutes and then somehow like stick academic achievement in there in the last two and a half seconds just so it sounds like we're talking about it. We have to have our own agenda item for the core mission of the school system every meeting. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I agree that it's a sad state of affairs that we actually are arguing about making this a topic uh, for every meeting because I believe it really should be. Um, I would also suggest that not everybody um, has the ability to join committee meetings that are headed, held in the middle of the day to discuss curriculum and other activities like that. So I am very hopeful that we can agree to put this on our meetings, uh, you know, in our regular meeting um, activity uh, so that we can help to inform the public, ask the important questions, and get the information out for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? None? Okay. Ms. Gilbert, may we take a roll call vote, please? Fucking thing. Point of order, Madam Chair, swearing. Excuse me. I didn't. What, what did you say, Ms. Rowe? I heard a member swearing live on their mic, and I'm raising a point of order for decorum. So we there's a lot of people that are live on the mic, and we don't know that it was a member. So. Um, before we make statements that it is a member, I think we should be um, cognizant of that. Also, I didn't hear swearing. I'm sorry, could everyone no, hear me okay? It can be reviewed. I heard it. Okay, but we don't know who said that. So before we make a disparaging comment about another board member, I think we need to um, be aware of that. Ms. Gilbert, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Abstain. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Pasteur? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Favor is seven. Okay, and um, just to confirm, for a uh, standing item to be added to the agenda, does it take two thirds, Mr. Mercedes, or is it is seven? I believe it takes two thirds, Ms. Scott, which would be eight. Okay. Um, according so then to our policies and rules, does it? Why does it take two thirds? If we can add to the agenda with a majority vote, according to our policy, does our policy not supersede Robert's rules? I believe it does. Well, one moment, Ms. Uh, Rowe, but um, this is to add a standing agenda item. Um, we add agenda items, but um, Mr. Mercedes, I guess that's what I was trying to see is because this is a standing agenda item, if it took two thirds. That is my understanding. Okay, then. I'd, so I'd, I'd be happy to have Ms. Howie weigh in if she's available. Is Ms. Howie on? I don't believe she's, she's not, she is on? Oh, Ms. Howie, are you available to weigh in on that? Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm on the call. The, had the board changed policy, it would only require seven votes. However, the board is through its singular action, make, basically making a standing roll of order. And in order to make a standing roll of order, they would, you would need a two thirds majority. Madam Chair. Thank you for that, Ms. Howie. Um, it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Hen. Yes, please go ahead. 
Yes, thank you. We are um, changing the agenda. We are not creating a standing rule of order for the board. It's an agenda item and the motion states until further action, meaning the board can take action to remove it from the agenda just as we are taking action to add it. So I would question the advice of council as to why we need two thirds. We are not creating a rule of order. We are creating an agenda item that will remain on the agenda until the board removes it. Ms. Hen, I looked back at the motion and you said that the board had a standing agenda item. Until so I, further notice. But you still put in there a standing agenda item. Um, and I can read it back to you. You said, uh, Ms. Hen moved that the board add a standing agenda item as the first item of new business to the current open session agenda and all future open sessions until further notice to discuss student performance and academic achievement. So the fact that it's a standing agenda item is um, why it re required two thirds. It wasn't a motion for this um, meeting, but you said going further until further notice. So. I can see why it takes two thirds. So um, both councils have agreed with that and have come to the same conclusion. And Madam Chair, if I may speak to that, the explanation Ms. Howie gave is that we are creating a, um, a new rule of, of order and that is not the case. We are creating an agenda item. The fact that it will remain on the agenda does not make it a, a rule of order. And I'd like, um, Council to cite the specific um, reasoning why that why they believe that that is a new standing rule of order. It's an agenda item, which is specifically distinct um, from rules of order. Well, it's a standing agenda item. Um, so I, I, I can see why council would say that. Um, it looks like uh, Miss Causey has a question or suggestion. Please go ahead, Miss Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to make the suggestion um, that would be. Um, with your uh, permission, that the meeting uh, proceed with the agenda item added and that legal would provide further guidance to the board officers at their agenda setting meeting with the superintendent. So, I'm sorry, go ahead, Miss. Yeah, the vote's already done and according to legal, it required two thirds to pass. So. Uh, perhaps maybe we could proceed with the agenda as it is, and then legal counsel could give us further guidance about it going forward. Um, Madam Chair, I, because I'm sorry. I don't think that we should go against legal counsel. Madam Chair, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. uh, proceed with the agenda item added to this meeting because it can be added to this meeting with only seven votes. Then another and vote would have to be taken to have it added to this meeting. It was added, the, the motion that we voted on was for it to be a standing item. So it would need to be a new motion to have it added to this agenda. Okay. Um, Ms. Scott, this is Ms. Jones. Oh, yes, Ms. Jones, we have not heard from you. Thank you. Um, so it looks like it, Dr. Williams, from what I heard, this extensive discussion will be discussing student achievement during the reopening plans. Uh, the motion has failed for two legal counsels, so I would suggest in interest of time that we move on and we discuss it during the reopening plans and um, revisit it at the next meeting to add it if the board so wishes as a standing item. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Williams did say he is going to address it. So any questions or anything we had, um, it will be addressed um, in this meeting. So um, that is actually something probably that we could consider doing so that we can move on um, because it's not like we are not addressing academic achievement. There will be a presentation and we will address it and then we can get legal counsel to weigh in and um, give us more feedback on that. So um, are there, there still more comments? Okay. Yes. Yeah, Are we ever uh, going no, to be able to Ms. move on? Ms. We need to move on. Ms. Um, um, <sighs> Scott, my, my comment that I wanted to make was before these people have sp who've spoken. If you look at the chat. Actually, it looks like everybody has used up their time with speaking um, okay, and that we I'll won't be, move on Ms. Scott, ever. I have not used up my time at all. Okay, please. Okay, so we're not okay. on something else. So then I have no more time. Is that what you're saying? I don't think anyone has um, any more time. I think we've all right. used but up our time. Spoke, and my name was up here before. So I'd just like to ask one question of Dr. Williams, please. And then I'm 
I'm done, but I was before Ms. Carson. Okay, please go ahead, Ms. Pester. We really, yeah. everyone, we really need to move on. We cannot get stuck on one agenda item when we have right, so I'm many things we need to discuss. This please, this everybody. Reopening. Could you restate yes. your question again, please? Are we revisiting this? Because I just wanted Dr. Williams to reiterate what he said, because we didn't say we weren't doing this. He just said he was going to do it in the first place. But I wanted to know, somebody said we were going to do this, revisit this and reopening. Is that so, Ms. Scott? We are. Dr. Williams is going to uh, discuss academic achievement and reopening, as he stated, as I've stated, has been stated multiple times. So okay. the, the arguing right. back and forth with the right. legal Thank counsel you. and both legal Opinions have said the same thing, and because it's not to the liking of several board members, we now are going back and forth and, and, and questioning the legal opinion from lawyers. I mean, I, 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 just, I just find this extraordinary um, because we don't like the response that we've been given, and we do need to move on. Everyone is, is out of time. So just click uh, Just let me in. Hello? Okay. Okay, so I, Chair, I believe I, everyone is out of time. So Madam we really, Chair, I, yes, Ms. Causey. I'm sorry, I don't believe I'm out of time. How much time does Ms. Causey have, Mr. Proceeds? Could you please put it in the chat? And um, if anyone else still has time, please put that in the chat so that we can attempt to have a meeting and process the rest of our agenda. Okay, it looks like you are all out of time. Let me see. Okay, Ms. Causey, you have 30 seconds. I make a motion that we add to this agenda a separate item for academic achievement. Could you put your motion in the chat, please? Second row. Okay. All right, so Ms. Causey has made a motion that Ms. Causey moved to this meeting that, well, Ms. Causey moved to this meeting, we add academic achievement as a separate agenda item and it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. Um, Ms. Gover, if we could please take a roll call vote on this. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yeah. Ms. Mack? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five. Okay, so that motion does not carry. Madam okay. Chair, this is so, Ms. Hen. Yes, Ms. Hen. If we're not going to be discussing the most important job of the board, I'm We are discussing sure. that, Ms. Hen. That's not a correct characterization. Dr. Williams is presenting I, I, academic I, I, achievement. So I made a motion. Oh, I made a motion to adjourn. You made a motion to adjourn because your agenda item was not your motion was not approved. If board members aren't interested in talking about academic achievement as the most important job, then there's no, really no, no reason to me. No, we are no, here addressing no, academic achievement, and that is no, that is not no, that that is no, not necessary. We're 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 moving on, Miss um, Hen. Um, so the agenda stands as presented, and um, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Lowry. Thank you. 
Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, recognition of deceased, certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Offerman. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Q. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Yeah. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Scott and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval. Coordinator, Secondary Mathematics in the Office of Mathematics. Do I have... Oops. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointment as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Ms. Causey. Oh. Oh, sorry, Mr. McMillian, I didn't see you. Apologies. Thank you. Um, do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. McMillian, thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. So I present Laura Potter for the position of coordinator in secondary mathematics. Currently, she is a teacher, resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics. She's been there for almost five years. And pr prior to that, she served as a mathematics teacher at Chesapeake High School and Dundalk Middle School. And prior to those experiences, she uh, worked four years in Hartford County Public Schools. So I present to you Laura A. Potter as the new coordinator of secondary mathematics. Congratulations, Ms. Potter. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Williams. Alrighty, our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The board Oops. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or behavior or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the tone. 
The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education, Participation by the Public. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. So the first to speak is, for elected officials, we have Delegate Harry Bendari. Mr. Bendari, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Scott, uh, Vice Chair Ken, and esteemed members of the Baltimore County Board of Education. First and foremost, thank you very much for extending to me the opportunity to address you all and provide an update on the 2021 the General Assembly as it draws to a close. I submitted a written testimony for tonight, so I will condense what I already submitted for my oral testimony. Legislatively, this was a big year for education. We started the session with an override of Governor Hogan's veto of the blueprint for Maryland's future, a multi-billion dollar decade-long plan to revitalize our education system while also providing necessary capital funding for the physical construction of schools and improvement to existing schools. This legislation will radically change things in our school system, providing but not limited to an increase in uh, for student funding statewide, as well as increased investment in early childhood development, better pay for Maryland educators, increased funding for special education services, expanded career technical education in high school across the state, and funding for school construction projects. To that last point on capital funding, I will certainly be fighting for every dollar I can. The overcrowding situation in District 8 and beyond has been untenable for quite some time. So I'm hopeful that with the passage of the blueprint, we'll be able to tackle these issues further. As it stands, we have two new schools, the new Northeast Elementary School at Rees Road and the new Northeast Middle School approved and ready for construction. The sooner we can get going on those, the better. And I hope we can add a new Northeast High School to the area with the additional funding provided in the blueprint. On top of the veto override of the blueprint, we also subsequently passed legislation that will help tackle the increasing learning gap as we deal with the ramification of the year of virtual learning. While many have adapted well to learning outside of the classroom, for some, it is a struggle. They need in-person, hand-on uh, experiences, and this will help provide tutoring for those students who need to make up ground post-pandemic. It also, it also extends the plan by a year as the veto pushed the timeline for implementation back. I'm pleased to announce that House Bill 48, which would bar sex offenders from attending comprehensive school throughout Maryland, unanimously passed the Senate today. Differences between the Senate and House version will need to be worked out, but this is a national, nation's first uh, and a strong response to events that transpired last year. Potential methods include utilizing MSD home and hospital programs, which provides education to those who cannot attend in-person classes, uh, though it is left up to um, local school board to develop the appropriate responses. This bill both uh, pr um, protects student and uh, educator while also co codifying the proper response for when a student has to register on the sex offender registry list. One thing I would be remiss not to mention is the ransomware attack that took place earlier this school year. I would like to see better communication with local and state officials when things of that nature take place. Finally, I would like to say that while not always perfect, I think that our state and local governments have strong relationships with uh, Dr. Williams, our superintendent, and the rest of BCPS leadership, as well as the Board of Education. It is not always easy, and there are certainly areas where communication needs to improve. But overall, I think there is a lot of mutual respect between entities, and we are all able to recognize that. While there may, be, there may be differences of opinion, we are all doing our best to provide the best learning environment for our students, faculty, and staff. But I think that both superintendent 
Dr. Williams and the board have been doing a great job, and I look forward to continuing working with you in the future. This is an exciting time as we get ready to implement the blueprint for Maryland's future, and we will need to work together to ensure that implementation goes up without a hitch. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you, Delegate Bendari. Next, we have Ashley Wellington calling in on behalf of Councilman Potoka. Good evening, Chair and Vice Chair. My name is Ashley Wallington. I am the Director of Community Relations for District 2. I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of Councilman Patoka. Councilman Patoka offers the school board his support. I'd like to also take a moment to thank the heroes of the pandemic, our teachers. You all wear many hats. Your hard work and selflessness has not gone unnoticed. We appreciate your ability to adapt and we look forward to a successful remainder of the school year. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Wallington. I now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak, and mm -hmm. our first speaker is Mr. Mm -hmm. Ryan Coleman um, from the NAACP Randallstown chapter. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Coleman. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Williams, and school board members. Uh, my name is Ryan Coleman, and I'm the president of the Randallstown NAACP. I want to thank all the Randallstown members signing on tonight to listen to the school board uh, meeting tonight. Our mission is to advocate for all children, especially children of color. Good news tonight, at least we have been talking about academic achievement, and it seems that all the members are at least on the same page as far as needing to talk about academic achievement. Research over the past 20 years clearly links the beliefs and actions of school boards with student outcomes. If school boards have the potential to harm student performance, couldn't they also do good? Research shows that the beliefs, actions, and relationships of school board members influence student learning in the classroom. Bottom line, the strength and stability of the school board affects student performance. It's more important than ever that school boards not only focus on district and student goals and performance, but also turn inward to ensure board stability and effective governance. I would request, request all board members envision themselves as trustees. Trustees are elected to exercise sound judgment and act in the best interest of those they serve. Research shows that when school board members think of themselves as trustees, the board displays better teamwork within the board, more cooperation with the superintendent, a stronger focus on student achievement. A trustee mindset is important to achieving exceptional school governance. Research suggests that board members who think of, think of themselves as trustees are not only more likely to support recommendations of superintendents, but also more likely to hold the superintendent accountable for student achievement. Public school governance is not exceptional when decisions are based on a minority public opinion. Minority public opinion rarely represents the best interests of all children. It usually only serves some students. It also tends to relate more to the past than our children's future. School board members committed to the best outcomes for every child recognize that the path to fulfilling a vision requires a commitment to a trustee mindset in every decision and action the board takes. This doesn't mean groupthink or unanimity or every decision. It's okay to be respectful to disagree in the boardroom. When operating effectively in trustee mode, board members contribute their individual thinking while maintaining a radical commitment to the goals of the entire board, which should be our children and their academic achievement. I look forward to hearing about the academic achievement, <clears throat> excuse me, I look forward to hearing a robust conversation about academic achievement during the reopening agenda item. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Next we have Dr. Danita uh -huh. Tolson from the NAACP Baltimore County Chapter. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tolson? Yes. Yes, Hi. you may go ahead. You? Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I am Dr. Danita Tolson, president of the Baltimore chapter 
um, the Ottawa County branch NAACP. The NAACP supports Dr. William and Chairperson Scott. At the last meeting, I was unable to speak on everything that was needed. I was disappointed to see that the majority of the meeting was focused on social media and other topics that didn't concern our students, our kids. There was so there was no discussion on curriculum being safe at the school as it relates to COVID or even traumatic events related to family deaths or youth mental health. No discussions on partnerships to make the school system better. Yes, curriculum and achievement should be discussed at each meeting. Please allow Dr. Williams and Ms. Scott to do their jobs. Do you tell a doctor how to perform surgery if you are having if you've never done surgery before. No, so please allow them to do their job. They are well qualified. We, the NAACP, are calling on all the minority churches to support Dr. Williams as Ms. Scott. If you want the school system to fail, then to continue to cause challenges to block these two. We are asking the board to focus on solutions instead of beating down Dr. Williams and Chairwoman Scott. Research says that it, it takes approximately three to five years to learn the job and make positive changes. Allow them equal opportunity as someone who is non-minority. Allow equal opportunity to good education, whether virtual or face-to-face. -face. Provide the support that Dr. Williams and Chairwoman Scott needs to make positive change. Stop providing barriers. Yes, we support sports is important just as um, as health, but health is more important um, and a good education for our, our kids. The kids are tremendously being impacted. We get much further when we work together. I ask you to prioritize what is important to make a positive change in our school system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tolson. Uh, next is General public comment and our first speaker is Miss Mary Taylor. Hi, Ms. good evening members of the board. I'm sorry, can everybody hear me? We can, I apologize, I think I cut you off. Please go ahead Miss Taylor. Thank you very much. Good evening members of the Board of Education. My name is Mary Taylor. I'm the Vice President of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. Listening tonight I heard much comment and discussion about academic achievement. So that allows me to discuss the senior class of 2021. They spent the last 13 most informative years of their lives within Baltimore County Public Schools. They put in hard work, time, energy into their studies, athletics, and other extracurriculars. They have made lifelong friends and connections with faculty members that have made them better people. Of all of this has been cut short. For these seniors, so much has been taken away over the past year, and they do not deserve to lose one more thing. They only do not deserve, they only do deserve the events, but science supports the events moving forward with precautions in place. All Marylanders over 16 are now eligible to get a vaccine, which most important is that schools, which are supposed to have the leeway to plan senior events, to actually have communication with parents and students and truly support their efforts. These events, prom, and most importantly, graduation, would be more inclusive, safer, and more supervised with school control. Seniors also want to know why AP exams are being scheduled so late. Students have been told that those exams will be scheduled weeks after they graduate and during what is supposed to be their senior week when the College Board offered earlier dates. Simply put, if we can't offer these seniors every senior event, let's give these seniors something they can hold on to after 13 years of hard work. Let's give them the graduation they earned and deserve. The seniors of Baltimore County Public School deserve to have a socially distanced graduation. Students and especially their families are planning around these pending events and need to have details, not confusion or last minute decisions. The parents, students, teachers and administrators of BCPS schools, I'm sure would be willing to help. Information needs to be communicated immediately. We all have a common goal, a safe, equitable and honorable graduation for the class of 2021. Their time is now. And one last thought, would someone on the board please make a motion tonight to increase the school week to five days by April 19th with in-person 
face-to-face learning. Counties all over Maryland have already increased to four to five days. It's time for our BCPS kids to have five to thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Next is Ms. Megan Hughes. Ms. Hughes, please go ahead. Yes, sorry, I decided to mute, mute the TV. Are you ready? Yes, Ms. Hughes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Megan Hughes, mother of three BCPS students. I'm also a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. My children are new to the district, but this is where I grew up. My husband is active duty military, so we've lived all over the country and world. Every place we have lived, I have compared my children's education to the one I received in Baltimore County. And honestly, it never lived up to what I had experienced. I was so excited that my children had the opportunity to have an amazing education as well. However, the decision to keep schools closed for so long has really impacted the learning experience this year. It's been difficult enough just to be the new kids at school, let alone in a virtual environment where most middle schoolers just don't feel comfortable turning their cameras on. However, along with the social isolation are the many distractions at home as compared to being in the classroom. Also, as the engagement decreases, so does the motivation. My two youngest children have had the opportunity to attend hybrid school, and my oldest had her first day back at school today. After his first day back a little over two weeks ago, my son exclaimed, that was the best day ever. I can't wait to go back tomorrow. He said he was able to focus better and was much more motivated, feeding off the energy being face-to-face with his teachers and classmates. But his next comment was, when can we go back every day? Dr. Sally Permer, a pediatrician, virologist, immunologist, as well as a mother to a school-aged child, wrote an open letter to her child's school district about the importance of fully opening schools. She and her colleagues have observed trends from school closure that signal potentially irreversible damage to children, which include a tidal wave of children requiring hospitalization for mental health crises, filling our emergency rooms because the inpatient units are already full, an obesity epidemic unrestrained, child maltreatment that is not being detected until it is too late as teachers are the number one reporters of child abuse and neglect in the home, a growing education gap for children living in low-income homes. Having an opportunity for hybrid school to start, but to really address these issues, we need the option for five days of in-school learning. The private schools in our area have offered it since August, and that was before the vaccine. Very soon, all teachers that want the vaccine should have an opportunity to receive it. The teachers will be protected, and several studies have shown that children are very low risk. In fact, children are 12 times more likely to drown than to die of COVID. Our neighboring counties of Harford and Carroll County have begun offering four days of in-school learning. The CDC has come out and stated that schools can use three feet instead of six feet of social distance as a mitigation strategy. That reduced distance should allow the space for all students that want to return full-time in school to do so. Lastly, I want you to know that I listened to this last Board of Education meeting and heard the concerns of the public speakers. I don't believe our coalition has ever advocated for getting rid of virtual learning for those that choose the option. I believe every parent knows their child best and will choose what is best for their family. We are all parents, love our children, and want to do right by our children. I respect the desire of other parents to keep their children home, but I know my children best and know that for their educational, emotional, social, and physical health, being in school five days a week will give them their best chance to succeed. I implore you to make a motion for five to thrive or at least four days a week like our neighboring counties. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Dave Patrick. Mr. Patrick, please go ahead. Hello. Yes, Mr. Patrick, please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me on. I'm sorry. We're just leaving a game right now. So um, I appreciate you uh, having me on. And um, I'm a proud member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. Um, our students need five to thrive. Five days a week in person school is absolutely necessary for our students' well-being. The mental health crisis among our youth is devastating and will be felt for decades. What is going on with graduation for our seniors? Why is there no information? Do we really have a date? Because it's been changed at least three times. Do we have a venue? Because we still have no info on that. It is all lip service and our class of 21 has been let down. Our Baltimore County Public School Board and its leader should be an example for our students, parents, and community. Unfortunately, the division within the board is extremely glaring and evident at every meeting. It's embarrassing for our students and parents to listen to the bickering and divisiveness that occurs within the board. Just two meetings ago, we had board members declaring each other racist as it took our student member, Mr. Mahomes, to try to intervene to take this name calling and accusations offline. 
The pandemic has brought to light some very concerning things that go on with our board and our leadership at Baltimore County Public Schools. I plead with this board and Superintendent Williams to be better, to do better, to want better for our children of Baltimore County because they deserve better. It's time for a change at the top. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have um, Miss Amy Adams. Miss Adams, please go ahead. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm a parent of three students and a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I have concerns about the 24 contracts being presented tonight, 12 of which were not discussed at the committee meeting this afternoon. I'm not sure how members can vote without information or with unanswered questions. Next, I want to remind everyone of the phrase, last to close, first to open. It's been repeated by many leaders at the federal and state level regarding status of schools. If non-essential businesses are now open to full capacity in our state and county, schools should be open five days a week for all students. If adults can fully participate in life, going to restaurants, bars, movie theaters, traveling to other states without restrictions, children should have full access to in-person learning. Can one of you please motion for students to return to school five days a week starting April 19th? Studies show that school spread of COVID-19 is much less than community rates because mitigation practices are strictly enforced at school. Our staff has had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. Maryland still ranks in the bottom four states for the number of in-person days in the country. Why? I have heard one concern of fully opening schools is related to equity. I would like the Board of Education to discuss the data that was presented at the Maryland State Board of Education meeting on March 22nd. Specifically, BCPS has the lowest attendance rate in the state at 80%. This calculates to 22,000 children enrolled in BCPS but not attending school. The identified group in this data with the highest decline in attendance is economically disadvantaged students. Both black and white student groups in the 20 county system in Maryland have had one to three percent decrease in attendance. What is being done to re-engage these students? How is keeping schools in a hybrid only model providing an adequate and equitable education to students when they're not even attending? According to the data presented at the same meeting, our students are failing at much higher rates compared to last year. The main difference is virtual school versus traditional school. How can the system address this information and move forward with the time remaining this year? What are the next steps in the reopening plan? When will more students be permitted to attend more days of school? What parameters must be met? Stop moving the goalposts. What are the details for the fall schedule? Parents need this information clearly communicated. Finally, I would like to address our high school seniors. I've talked to many families who tell me their child feels abandoned by BCPS. Seniors feel as if they don't matter. They no longer have trust in the system to provide them with any type of recognition or celebration for their 12 years of hard work. When will BCPS release graduation dates and locations for the class of 21? If Towson University is not an approved location for graduation at individual schools are to plan these events, they need to start now with this information. Families around the county have said some high school principals are working with seniors and their families to plan safe and celebratory events. Some principals are not working with these groups, but not stopping them from planning. Other principals are actively trying to shut down non-sanctioned events. Where is the equity in that? It's been a difficult year for many people in our community, but let's honor the seniors and send them off to their next chapter with a recognition that they all deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. And next, it looks like we have um, Ms. Carol Vidal. Ms. Vidal, please go ahead. Around the county. Hello? Yes, we were getting some feedback. Is this Ms. Vidal? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, okay thank you. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Chair, Ms. Scott, and board members of BCPS. I'm a parent of a sixth and a fourth grader in BCPS, a physician who specializes in child and adolescent psychiatry working in Baltimore City Public Schools, and I have a background in public health. I'm also a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, which includes thousands of parents, the majority of whom have more than one child, and whom, along with the thousands of students who have already left BCPS this year, represent a good portion of the student body that did not support school closures. I'm speaking tonight to ask for an option to a five-day return to in-person instruction for all students who choose to return this spring and in the fall next year. Our district is third from, from the bottom in school reopening in a state that ranks fourth from the bottom in the country, and BCPS has yet to commit to a full reopening in the fall. Many reasons have been given for not opening earlier during the pandemic. I will focus on the main ones, science, health, and equity. 
The science related to COVID says that schools have been and continue to be safe for children and adults with mitigation strategies such as opening windows, masking, and maintaining a safety distance are in place. Schools were safe regardless of community transmission rates, even before vaccination was widespread. Our teachers have been prioritized for vaccination, and Governor Hogan has said that every adult who wants to will be vaccinated in a month. The vaccine is highly effective, reducing infection, disease, death, and transmission. Regarding health, we know that COVID is of low risk for children, but we know that many other health issues children experience, such as depression, suicide attempts, anxiety, obesity, visual problems, substance use, eating disorders, and child abuse have increased during the pandemic. National data show that suicide rates are 10 times higher than COVID deaths for children, and yet we have continued to isolate children, taking away their social home. It is discouraging to hear the board continue to talk about seeing what happens with the metrics and or mentioning COVID vaccinations for children younger than 12. Equity has been the latest reason for not fully reopening. While I think there should be a choice for families who want to remain virtual during the pandemic, reach, reaching equity does not involve closing school doors. It involves having community meetings to discuss safety measures and regaining the public's trust. You have not openly said it, but your proposals to implement Saturday school and summer programs imply that you know virtual learning has incurred in learning loss. The system has failed many students with learning disabilities. Many black and brown students have disengaged from school. And many low-income families, especially the women in those families, have struggled to maintain their jobs or have been removed uh, from the workforce com completely. You tell me if it is equitable for a 30-year-old black mom to have to quit her job and move back to her ex-husband's home to teach her child because schools were closed. That is not equity. Why not offer full return to the families who want it? It is also not equitable that for an entire year you have put public school students at disadvantage from private school students attending in person, which in the end will just widen the income gap. Public schools should be worshipped and treated like the most valuable asset of any society. You now have the funding to do that. Please do it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Bash. For, yeah. Mr. Bash Ferrone. We're hearing some feedback, Mr. Ferrone. Yes. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Do not have the time to do that. Please do it. Thank you. Mr. Ferrone, you need to mute your um, background. Yes, good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening to all. Easter is about peace to all, love to all. God loves all his creation, black, white, and in between, Asians, Africans, Latinos, and Anglo-Saxons. All three Abrahamic faiths teach the same. Still, we have discrimination of color, faith, national origin in our public school. In 1995, Dr. Berger was my superintendent. He favored his faith over others. Dr. Hirston tried to correct the bias, but could not. Dr. Dance was dancing away at the time. We still, in 2021, have anti-Muslim stereotypes in the curriculum. Yes, BCPS removed the stereotype images last month of the three hijabi girls that are labeled as radical. When you see a roach in your quarters, you are likely to have a hundred of them hiding. This should be the mission of this board and this administration. In the curriculum. Yes. DCPS removed the stereotype images last month of the three hijabi girls that are labeled as radical. Excuse me, Mr. Farone, we can't hear you. I, I, I don't know what happened. Um, and we can hear you now. Um, so uh, basically, Please find out where our teachers are poisoning the minds of our students with false ideas, that one face is better than others, that one color is more beautiful than others, that one head scarf is more civilized than others. The Blessed Mary, the Virgin Mary, wore Arab hijab. The disciples of Jesus Christ wore 
Arab head card and Arab garbs. A non-hijab is just really a fashion modification of a Muslim hijab. An Orthodox Jewish woman hijab looks close to the Muslim hijab. Both they believe in the same God. They just give God a different name and brag about whose God is better. BCPS stereotype against Muslims is the cause why this nation went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan without justification. We killed so many Muslims and so many of our soldiers and Marines, and we wasted trillions of dollars just because we teach hate against Muslims. We could have done with these trillions building of schools, raising salaries. Thank you, Mr. Farone. Looks like your time has has come. Thank you, Mr. Farone. And next... Thank you. And next we have Miss Diana Bergman. Miss Bergman, please go ahead. Greetings, Board Chairperson Makita Scott and Superintendent Dr. Williams, Board Members of Baltimore County Public Schools. Welcome back. And I hope everybody enjoyed their much needed spring break. Once upon a time in a school district not so far away, there was a Board of Education made of both elected and appointed members. Some members came with experience and knowledge of education, spend years in the classroom with very little funds, actually teaching children across the land of Team BCPS. However, some board members had a very different view of what our school system is supposed to be, without any knowledge of public education whatsoever, worried about 15 minutes extension of the workday and forgetting that Baltimore County is the only jurisdiction that only pays teachers for 10 months and not a full school year. Some educators barely get paid a livable wage. Thankfully, across the beautiful state of Maryland, we had former mathematician and chancellor of the University System of Maryland, Chancellor Britt Kerwin, had a wonderful idea of an education funding formula that will provide a world-class education for every child regardless of zip code. Many knowledgeable educator supporters rally in favor of the blueprint, and with time, the, the introduction of Blueprint 2.0 Blueprint 2.0 was like the world baby with chart to help spend federal funds dedicated to education during recovery of COVID-19. One day, a dangerous, terrible ideology swept the district. An anonymous letter by the name of Q brought forward four followers. Q followers somehow made it to the Board of Education. Q followers believe in conspiracy theories. For example, that somehow we must continue to cut curriculum and reallocate funds or involve the county council to threaten budget cuts for education unless we had a summer school program that our school system has already planned to make available free of charge. Tonight, you'll hear discussions of new language and ethical policies influenced by some Q followers and added oversight for every single educator in our system. Pay attention to the conspiracy theories, like an overpaid budget analyst, the idea of an elected superintendent without meeting state requirements, all because some still believe that Dallas Dance still has friends in our school system. So all technology must go. Thrive for five is the hidden code for the Sneaky Five. And at the end of the day, none of the Sneaky Five have ever taught a classroom full of children with barely any funds in the middle of a pandemic. Team BCS, BCPS doesn't thrive just for five days. Instead, we thrive for a lifeline of learning experience to provide a world-class education. Our achievement standards are set high, and we teach empathy to adjust and cope with changing times. If the Sneaky Five are having challenges to learn how to cooperate, it's time to teach them the coping skills that public education is very capable of doing together as a team. Thank you very much, and we've been open all school year. To say otherwise is plain ignorance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Next, it looks like we have Rachel Schiefland. Ms. Schiefland? Yes. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead, Ms. Schiefland. Okay. Thank you. I'm a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, and I have two children in BCPS. I believe every parent should have a choice to decide what's best for their child, whether that is virtual or in-person learning. After listening to the last few board meetings, it is clear that there is no plan for the safe return to schools for the rest of this year or even for the fall. 
As of today, all BCPS children will be allowed to go back two days a week. However, with the increase in the number of teachers vaccinated and the lifting of COVID restrictions in our state and nationally, I'm pleading with you to follow the science and the recommendations of our nation's top experts to allow for more in-person instruction for those that choose to go back to school. We are surrounded by Carroll County, Harford County, Baltimore City, and Pennsylvania, all of which are safely going back now four to five days a week. Over the last year, we have seen our kids' obesity, suicide, depression, and eating disorder numbers skyrocket. These kids have suffered long enough. I understand Baltimore County is a large and diverse school system, and planning for a full reopening is no easy feat, but it has been a year. How do we not even have a plan to bring these kids back full-time in the fall? What have you been doing? It's incomprehensible. How many more children do we have to admit to our psychiatric hospitals? How many more kids with disabilities will get left behind? How many more parents will have to quit their jobs to supervise virtual learning before Baltimore County will decide to do their job and get our kids back to school five days a week? My daughter has a few comments you need to hear as well. My name is Emily, and I am in third grade. I hate virtual learning. I used to love school. I used to love learning new things. Now I don't want to get out of bed because I know I just have to sit in front of a computer all day. I miss my friends and I miss my teachers. I miss being happy. I have a condition called nystagmus, which makes it hard for me to see. I have to hold the computer very close to my face to read anything, and it makes me my head and eyes hurt every day. It's not just kids like me with a disability who are hurting. Some days I go to virtual learning center because my parents have to work and I see other kids cry and punch the table and get so frustrated they give up. I have a friend that went to the hospital because he said he would rather die than go to virtual learning. <laughs> It's only eight, and this isn't fair, and it feels like nobody cares. I love my teachers. They are trying to help us, but this will get better with us stuck at home. Please listen to us kids that are hurting. Please, Dr. Williams, listen to your heart. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shevlin. Next, we have Jen Reed Holm. Ms. Holm, please go ahead. Ms. Jen Reed Holm. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you to all the members of the board for this opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Jen Reed Holm. I have three children in third, sixth, and eighth grades, and I'm a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I am asking the board to take a hard look at why students with disabilities have been discriminated against in every reopening plan. Discriminated against is a strong phrase, and that is exactly what I meant to say. Students who have disabilities, who have IEPs or 504s, and are mainstreamed in the general education setting have been basically dismissed and rejected. These students include those in advanced academic programs and are consistently and continuously left out of every conversation. This subset of students need their in-school accommodations, their in-school services, and most importantly, in-person instruction, yet they're talked away like they don't matter. Hey, is anyone listening right now? I need you to hear this loud and clear because I see everyone bustling papers or typing at your computers. Please stop and listen. Your current behavior shows me that you are continuing to dismiss these students. I heard that laugh. Students with disabilities matter. Students on IEP and 504 plans in general education must be returned back to the classroom for more than just two days a week. They must be returned for both cohorts immediately. We don't have to call this a wasted year because there's still time to salvage what is left and time to undo the damage BCPS has caused these students. Who is on the board that is brave enough to make a motion tonight? Who is on the board that's really gonna start advocating for students with disabilities? Who on this board is actually going to re represent the stakeholders of BCPS? Prove to the parents who have students with learning differences that you actually care. These students are not receiving their free and appropriate education. These are some of the most vulnerable learners in our school system who need additional support in order to be available to learn and be successful academically. It is appalling and absurd 
that BCPS waited to include these students in the very last phase for return and for only two days a week. School systems around us made these students a priority, offering five days a week, and in many cases were the first to return to classrooms over their typical peers. These students deserve better. Ideally, all students need to be returned to the classroom for five days this year, five days to thrive. There is no reason to keep these kids from the classroom any longer. Cohorts are being mixed for sports while sharing sporting equipment. Sports have been made a priority over academics. That is wrong. With the current CDC guidance of three feet for social distancing, BCPS can certainly make room for students to return five days a week. Stop making excuses. This is feasible. Now go do the right thing. Make the motion for students on IEPs and 504s to return to both cohorts starting immediately and for all students to return five days a week. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. All right, and that concludes our um, general public comment. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Team BCPS. Today marks the first day that students from all groups had the opportunity to begin hybrid in-person learning through our phase in process. Schools are busy with new routines that keep both students and staff safe using mitigation strategies, recommend, recommendations by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Maryland Department of Health. There is true excitement as staff members welcome back students into buildings, classrooms, and athletic events. While it is always a pleasure to watch our educators and students connect through instruction, it is just as satisfying to see students and staff meet in person and deepen their relationships. During the last meeting of the board, the design team shared the goal of phasing in four days per week of hybrid in-person learning starting uh, as soon as May or early May, and more discussions around that will continue as we looked at our original phase one and phase two students returning. But to prepare for that, we will continue to monitor transmission and mitigation practices throughout this month. I hope you will join me in thanking our principals, assistant principals, educators, support staff, school nurses, and everyone who has made hybrid learning possible, including our staff in facilities, food and, nut and nutrition, transportation, and IT. There is such strength in our team, and there is such power in Team BCPS. Before spring break, I had an opportunity to visit Sudbrook Magnet Middle School as staff welcomed their sixth graders to their building for the first time. Today, I visited Woodlawn High School in Southwest Academy as we transition another group of students to begin hybrid in-person learning. Our staff worked well to provide these opportunities for students. I'm so pleased that by the middle of March, we reached a saturation point in our outreach to staff about receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. All staff have been given the opportunity to receive the vaccine at multiple clinics run by BCPS staff. This extra layer of protection makes our schools, offices, and communities even safer. Before we go any further, it is my pleasure to recognize Christian Thomas, a junior at Eastern Technical High School. Christian was elected by middle school and high school students to serve as our next student member of the board. Christian is class president and is a well-rounded leader in both humanitarian and political endeavors. We look forward to having Christian join the board on July 1st, 2021. This week marks both National Assistant Principals Week and National Library Week and School Library Month began on April 1st. On our website, through social media, and on our blog, please join us in recognizing our assistant principals for their outstanding leadership and our library media specialists for the extensive res resources and support they provide to students and schools. I would also like to congratulate 
Munachi Nkonyi Mbekwe, a senior at Eastern Technical High School who was among 27 students selected to receive $40,000 scholarship College Board Opportunity Scholarship. So congratulations, Munachi. And finally, I'm pleased to share an update on the work of the Compass, our strategic plan. Back in October 2020, I announced 11 system improvement teams, which are designed to build coherence and cohesion among the school system as we make progress towards the goals of the Compass. The interdisciplinary teams bring together system administrators and school-based staff to analyze data and develop recommendations for research and equity-based enhancements. Three themes emerge from our recent mid-year summaries of the system improvement teams, access and opportunity, professional learning, and systems and structures. System improvement teams are expected to make recommendations to me and to the board by the end of June 2021. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the board chair's report, and that's me. And um, I would like to thank everyone for, uh, for joining us this evening for our Board of Education meeting. I'd like to welcome all of our students back from spring break and back to school. Today, um, cohort A uh, began in-person learning and on Thursday, cohort B will begin in-person learning. So I would just like to thank all of our hardworking staff, our principals, our teachers, everyone for their hard work and tireless commitment to our students, scholars, as um, some are returning in school and others are opting for to remain virtual and um, they are all participating in hybrid learning. Um, as you can see, we as a board are also participating in the hybrid process. Some of us are attending remotely from our homes or, or other places, while a few of us are actually here with staff at Greenwood. Several board members, like many BCPS students, are choosing to remain in a hybrid fashion. So, um, but we're still um, here. It was great to hear from the public and um, really um, have, a, have a really good board meeting. So again, I'd like to welcome back students. Thank you, teachers and staff. Your commitment and support you've shown to students and parents um, has, has been really phenomenal. And like all of you, I appreciate hearing from Dr. Williams last, at the last board meeting about the um, upcoming summer school, Saturday school, the reopening plan. And tonight, I'll look forward to hearing about uh, academic achievement of BCPS students. So thank you for that. Sorry. Next on the agenda is the student member of the board report, and that's Mr. Mahomza. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair, Superintendent Williams, and fellow board members. I hope everyone was able to take the short holiday break to rest and be with their family members. I especially hope that those students who have returned to in-person uh, learning today had a smooth transition after a year-long hiatus that has brought uncertainty, heartache, and many changes. Students, with the third quarter ending next week, I hope everyone is doing their very best to finish on a strong note. This goes most importantly to all seniors. I know this year has, hasn't been a traditional school year, but it's important that we give it uh, give it our all as we're in the final weeks of our high school career. All of you have accomplished many things respectfully, respectively, and your, te your parents, teachers, and every stakeholder in our county is cheering you on. I also want to thank our teachers and administrators for their continued work in preparing for hybrid learning. Over the last two weeks, I had the pleasure of testifying at the state legislature in favor of a hate symbols prohibition in schools, excluding uh, learning materials. I also participated as a panelist on the Baltimore County Public Library episode of their race conversation with other educators from around the county, hosted a student conversation on, on my show, Chat Cafe, which can be found on BCPS TV, uh, and the topic was reopening schools. As I mentioned during my last testimony, I've been working to improve my communication with students and increase awareness of the available means of communication. With the help of the Chief of Staff's Office, I was able to restore the SMOB page on the new BCPS website. It includes information about my role, 
platform, updates, social media, student handbook, and mental health resources. This page can be found under the Family and Community, community Engagement tab. I've also added a new Google document sign up on my social media platforms. This will allow students and community members to seamless, seamlessly schedule meetings with me. This gives all students the opportunity uh, to schedule virtual meetings uh, with me without, any, without going through the hassle of emailing. And it's my hope it will increase transparency of my work. <laughs> After hearing from many students and parents about concerns for not having end of year senior activities, I reached out to Superintendent Williams to seek clarification on the announcement that was made prior to spring break and offer my insight on providing every senior with opportunities to engage in senior activities. He, he assured me that all schools and senior classes have been given the leeway to plan events based on, on their traditions and preferences, whilst also, for, while also preserve, uh, observing the health and local guidelines cons uh, concerning outdoor events. I'm thankful for the initial guidance on how schools should proceed with graduation and uh, their senior events. And I look forward to further information being given to students. I want to thank uh, former SMOB finalist Logan Dubal for joining my team and working with me to ensure that we can we, we provide schools with necessary supports so that senior activities can continue as previous years. In the next couple of weeks, Logan and I will try to meet with as many senior class officers uh, as we can in assisting them in any way that is needed. And I also look forward to future conversa conversations with the superintendent to find out the status of the, these events countywide. Uh, special thanks to Vice Chair Hen for working with me, uh, for, for working with me these last few months in advocating for in-person graduation and senior activity. I encourage students, teachers, and parents who are planning events or want to plan events to reach out to me if they require any assistance. Lastly, I want to include. I want to conclude by once again congratulating the SMAB elect and my predecessor, uh, my successor, Christian Thomas, a junior at Eastern Tech High School. Everyone can read Christian's resume on the BCPS website and follow him on social media. Over the next few weeks, I'll be helping Christian with a smooth transition to this role. He's eager to listen and lead. He's probably even watching right now. So I encourage all BCPS board members and community members to reach out, welcome him with open arms, and assist him in being an effective voice for all students. Thank you, team. Thank you, Josh. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening, Ms. Scott. No action to report from closed session. Thank you, Mr. Brusades. May I have a motion to approve the, um, oh, I'm sorry, there was no action to, there's no motion. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to increase board member time to two minutes each for academic achievement and two minutes to discuss reopening issues. Second, Mac. Could you put that, you put that in the chat, please? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey made a motion to increase board member time to two minutes each for academic achievement and two minutes to discuss reopening issues. And that was seconded by Ms. Hen. May I speak to Is that? I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. I, who was the second? Ms. Mack. Oh, okay. So that was seconded by Ms. Mack. Yes. And you asked if you could speak to your motion. Yes, please do. Thank you, Ms. Scott. In the interest of time, I think board members... Uh, we'll have an opinion one way or another. So I would suggest that we not make comments, but just go ahead and take the vote. And I don't even want to call the vote to take that extra time to vote. So um, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just clarifying. So it's, board members already get two minutes apiece to speak. So you're saying an additional two minutes for academic achievement and two minutes for reopening. So the board members have a total of six minutes to speak. Is that how I understand this? 
or was your intention for it to be four minutes total for board members? Well, I'd like it to be unlimited, but I'm saying four because I think that will be acceptable to the majority of board members. Yeah, no, I just, um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand the motion. Certainly. Okay. All right. Are there any questions? Any discussion? Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rob? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six. Okay. So the motion um, does not pass. So um, Dr. Williams, if you could please go ahead with your reopening. Sure. So good evening, everyone. Um, if we can see the PowerPoint. Uh, the first part I will be presenting, and then I will ask our design team members to bring forth some updates. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to provide a holistic update about Team BCPS academic performance. I appreciate the opportunity to share our entire story with you this evening while discussing our pre-pandemic status, methodology, collective goals, and the impact of a national crisis on our school communities and renewed focus. As you know, thanks to the tireless efforts of our school staff in collaboration with the district, our schools were able to successfully engage in a phased in reopening, beginning with our youngest learners in March. We're excited that the remaining phases of students across our schools who selected hybrid learning return today. We remain thankful to our school staff for their level of engagement and commitment to student learning throughout this time. Next slide, please. So I wanna take you back just a little bit. So our update on academic performance starts with my 100 day entry plan that began on July 1 of 2019. Four work groups focus on the goals areas of the Blueprint 2.0 in conjunction with a series of community conversations that provided multiple opportunities for stakeholders to directly share successes, challenges, and recommendations to help shape the budget process for the school year 2021, as well as the new strategic plan. Next slide. The Compass, our pathway to excellence, identified five district focus areas that clearly define our pathway to success, learning accountability and results, safe and supportive environment, high performing workforce in alignment of human capital, community engagement and partnerships and operational excellence. These areas reflect our collective responsibility to focus on a set of clear goals that can help us improve student outcomes while responding to the current and future needs of our system. Our next level of work was to build coherence across the district and develop a robust plan for professional learning and implementation. We aligned all of our guidance documents to ensure that they supported our ultimate goal of improved student achievement. Our ultimate goal is to ensure that across Baltimore County Public Schools, we utilize the strategic plan to implement coherent and cohesive structures and processes focused on achieving success in order to systematically facilitate continuous improvements centered on data and research based effective practices to improve education and ensure all students, including identified underserved students, will demonstrate growth in learning. Next slide, please. In developing the compass, we worked together to examine the story of Baltimore County. We wanted to know who we were, our history, current state, and desired state. We learned that since school year 1977, BCPS has been transformed from a predominantly white school system to one that demonstrates considerable diversity of racial and ethnic minorities. In fact, beginning in school year 2007, BCPS had more non-white students than white students. 
This illustrated why we needed to examine new ways of doing things that meet the needs of different students. Next slide, please. Our student needs have changed over time. Our English learners, or L's, increased by 166% over the past 10 years, 17% over the past year. Next slide. Many student populations requiring the more intensive support grew much faster than the overall enrollment. Next slide. Before the pandemic, BCPS saw a 25% increase in the number of students eligible for free and reduced price meals over the past decade, while our English learners have grown 166% and the number of homeless children went up by 82% over the past 10 years. Next slide. An examination or initial examination of graduation rates highlighted an area of success BCPS maintains a high school graduation rate that exceeds the state of Maryland four-year graduation cohort rate. We are also examining our fifth-year cohorts to include our learners who need more time to successfully complete requirements. Next slide. So while the overall graduation rate in our district is commendable for some of our students, examination of disaggregated data revealed opportunities for improvement. Specifically, prior to the pandemic, we engaged in an in-depth analysis of BCPS trend data for the last decade. We identified a need to focus on increasing graduation rates for Hispanic and African-American students and our multi-race students. The same was true for students receiving special education services in English language learners. Working together, we identified a college and career readiness trajectory from birth to 12th grade that included specific data points that and indicators that would increase the percentage of college and career ready students across our district. Next slide, please. Thank you. As a reminder to the board, you also develop draft goals associated with the Compass, our pathway to excellence. This slide highlights the first focus area with a pathway to college and career readiness, including a variety of the aforementioned data points from kindergarten to grade 12. Next slide, please. The Board of Education draft, drafted goals for focus area one and reflected a commitment to partner with Team BCPS to monitor and discuss student participation and performance using multiple measures, including external and internal assessments, as well as academic and social emotional indicators, including, but not limited to, MAP and our measure and other measures of academic growth, attendance, suspension, MCAP performance, our state assessment in English language arts and mathematics, five-year trend data, college and career readiness, participation and performance in AP exams, GT and SAT programs. As we prepare our board work and retreat, we can schedule regular updates on these data points for the remaining of the year and next school year. Yes, we all want better outcomes for our students and a plan to present, discuss, and to hear about the work that we are doing to address the achievement gap, or any learning loss or to accelerate learning. Next slide, please. With a clear path forward, we made connections across all areas of the district to ensure that our tools, strategies, and processes are supported uh, with the ultimate goal of improved student achievement. One, our teaching and learning framework provided schools with a common set of beliefs and expectations. As schools engage in continuous improvement through implementation of our school progress plans, leadership teams came together with the support of central office to identify specific priorities in the areas of focus connected to annual targets that help to improve learning, coupled with a plan to address professional learning. Staff collaborated in professional learning opportunities to identify common expectations and analyze student process, progress in real time 
to inform instructional decisions. And finally, our student learning outcomes, SOOs, were used as the vehicle that captured the process of individual staff reflection and analysis of student data to identify student learning goals to strengthen instructional practice and outcomes for students. This was the pre-COVID-19 BCPS plan forward. An intentional focus on teaching and learning with an investment in professional learning in support of improved student outcome. Our long range plan with annual targets was developed in direct response to our system's needs. Next slide. Schools develop plans, train staff, re-engage students throughout the summer. Many approach the year with a hybrid mindset focused on success as the global health pandemic and community unrest continued and became more devastating, our district worked directly with our schools to support them through a variety of shifting needs. Schools have worked tirelessly to meet both the social wellness and academic learning needs of staff and students with the understanding that we must use this pandemic as an opportunity to provide organizational performance at the micro and macro levels. Students and staff have experienced a complete change in day-to-day -day activities, extreme focus on health and safety, and change in pedagogy as they experience different degrees of fear, grief, and loss. Next slide, please. I know you join me in concern for our students and their well-being, both social, emotionally, and academically. Nationally, Students have experienced atypical learning for more than 12 months. Many researchers have tried to quantify the impact on learning to help schools plan and focus on support. If we take a look at these graphs from McKinsey and Company focusing on NWEA RIT scores, focus on student progress and growth, you will note the continuum, continuum of impact based on student experience. The green line represents a March return for our youngest and highly impacted learners in our public separate day schools. Some of our students have experienced learning loss with no instruction, the bottom line, which is light blue. Others have had a learning slowdown based on the quality of learning that may have nothing to do with schools and everything to do with the very real negative impact of this global pandemic. While some of our students have experienced learning slowdown simply because or based on the average remote learning as compared to what the greater educational community knows about the impact of typical in-person learning. The second chart estimates the average months of learning loss by student group. African American, Hispanic and low income students nationally are experiencing greater learning loss from student disengagement and lack of access. Our BCPS data is consistent with the national trends. Next slide. If we examine second quarter student achievement as reported to MSDE for this current school year, we notice a steep decline in attendance across levels in our schools. For comparison, last year's attendance percentage for all students across the system was 93.5%. The second quarter during virtual learning, it was 79.6%. Across our elementary schools, economically disadvantaged, students with disability and black students, black or African American students, had lower attendance rates than their peers. As a system, there was an 18.4 decrease in attendance from elementary school to middle school and an additional 5.2% decrease from middle school to high school. At the secondary level, our African American, Hispanic, two or more races, students with disability, English learners, and economically disadvantaged students had the lower attendance rates. The chart plots the distribution of the data in descending order of frequency. Our Asian students have the highest attendance and conversely, uh, economically disadvantaged students have the lowest percent of attendance. The orange line is a cumulative line representing percentage of the total. 
We know that our schools have immersed themselves in the work since last spring. They have mobilized attendance committees, work with PPWs, social workers, community agencies, and families to improve attendance. The impact of COVID-19 is far reaching, and we know that we will have to continue to innovate and work differently as we move forward. Next slide. Second quarter student performance. The blue color represents last year. The orange represents this year. It's important to note that 76% of our high schools implemented a four by four schedule this year. This means that 76 of our students have had half the number of courses. I know we all find these failure rates alarming despite our best efforts. The work that the school teams have been doing in spite of limited access to leading data is appreciated. We know our schools need additional resources, support, flexibility, and time. We will continue to monitor student performance, identify additional opportunities for support, as well as collaborate with other large districts to identify strategies for continuous improvement and effective practices to respond to any learning loss. Our focus on system collaboration and coherence is to ensure that our schools have what they need to help our students succeed. Next slide. Here is a quick overview of the work of the system improvement team that includes the 11 focus areas and a sample of their charge. The concept of the system improvement team is to have both school-based and central office leaders analyze available data, observe trends for both quantitative and qualitative data points, frame the current state, identify questions to investigate, identify specific measurable objectives, have access to resources and central office staff, and develop a communication plan to share findings, recommendations to practices and interventions, and next steps. These strategic work groups meet regularly to review progress and collectively plan opportunities to highlight best practices and formulate recommendations. Next slide. The State Board of Education has decided to not administrator the MCAP this year, yet will be postponed in the fall. More information is expected. I will speak about graduation requirements in a few minutes. Our access for our English learners is still open and we will finalize our plans for this administration. The Kindergarten Readiness Assessment, or KRA, was not administrated by MSDE for this school year. Although there was no map for reading and mathematics, we utilized diagnostic tasks and curriculum-based assessment to assess learning. In order to address unfinished teaching from the emergency closure in the spring, Content offices design diagnostic tasks to be administered at point of use aligned to the prerequisite skills and standards addressed in the upcoming unit. Teachers use these diagnostic tests to identify areas of instruction needed to ensure student success and plan responsive small group instruction to address targeted skills for specific students while making adjustments to the planned scope and sequence to address areas of instructional need reflected across all students. While the diagnostic tests show areas of instructional need, the end of the unit assessments indicate that the targeted instruction students are able to make progress to meet anticipated targets at the level commiserate with prior years. During the summer of 2020, I created a system improvement team, two of the 11 groups focusing on reading and Algebra 1. Grade three is the final year students should be learning to read. After a while, after that, they are reading to learn. Grade three and above should be diagnosing a focus on discovering deficits. And students should always remain in core curriculum and be provided supplemental instruction as determined to be needed through progress monitoring. The Maryland's keys to comprehensive literacy include instructional leadership, strategic professional learning, continuity of standards and evidence-based instruction, comprehensive system of assessment, tiered instructions and intervention, family and community partnerships. 
an ongoing focus on mathematics being incorporating bridges in elementary schools and our work to re-examine the math teaching and learning prior to Algebra 1. Next slide, please. We continue our efforts to support our students on these national exams. We offered a Saturday SAT administration on December 5th, which was open to BCPS and non-BCPS students. We also offered a modified SAT day on March 24th. Keep in mind, if students tested more than once, the highest score is used. Our college and career readiness target for SAT is as follows, reading the evidence-based reading and writing at 480 or higher, and mathematics at a 530 or higher. In 2020, the state average reading score was 523 and the average math score was 511. In addition, we were able to schedule a PSAT administration on January 26. Our work began in August with the creation of the SAT ACT AccuPlacer System Improvement Team to re-examine our strategies to prepare our students for these assessments and increase our performance on these assessments. Next slide. Last year, College Board modified the AP exam and schedule. This year, there's additional flexibility, which include paper and pencil, as well as digital exams. Also, the system improvement team is focusing on students having access to GT, honors, and AP classes, and strategies to increase performance on the AP exams. Next slide. Last year, we had over 16,000 students who enrolled in at least one AP course, and we are working on the numbers of students taking the exam and to receive a score of three or higher, which you see are just some of our test results regarding last year's AP performance. Next slide. On Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021, the State Board of Education met to discuss the impact of the various school models on the availability of students or seniors to complete graduation requirements. The State Board voted to establish the, fo the following. Students must still meet the 21 credit graduation requirements. These credits include passing the assess course of Algebra I, English 10, Life Science, and American Government. Assessment requirements for student graduation in the 2020-2021 school year uh, have been waived. These students also will not need to complete the bridge projects. All seniors have met the assessment requirements if they graduate in the 2021 20, school year. Student service learning hours for students graduating this year have been waived. In addition, waivers have been requested for various CTE completed program requirements, such as the program for cosmetology, curriculum for nail uh, technician, and the program for barbers. Next slide. Our graduation rate rates remain constant, but we have more work to do when we disaggregate our data. We're also looking, as I reported earlier, our fifth year cohorts where students need additional time and support to graduate. In addition, we're looking at the rigorous course or of high school completers the number of students who have uh, accomplished at least four of the six rigorous high school performance indicators. They are the completion of a foreign language or two or more credits in the same foreign language with a grade of B or better, the percentage of high school completers who've earned one or more credits in mathematics at a level or uh, higher than algebra two in geometry with a grade of B or better, the percent of high school completers who've earned four credits of science with a grade of B or better, the percent of high school completers who've earned two or more credits for approved advanced technology education with a grade of B or better, the percentage of high school completers who've earned a total of 1,000 or higher on the SAT or a score of 20 or higher on the ACT or both, 
and the percentage of high school completers who've earned a cumulative grade point average of 3.0 or higher on a scale of 4.0. Next slide. In reference to graduation, there are two system improvement teams. One's focusing on graduation rates, and the second one is focusing on CTE courses, not only the course, the completion, and licensure, as well as students enrolled in AVID. So the road ahead is not an easy one for any of us. We will continue to move forward in service of students. We know how to do the work of continuous improvement and have built the infrastructure for implementation. Team BCPS, like all other school systems, has had to shift our approaches and, re and respond to a variety of competing priorities this year because that had to be required. However, we remain steadfast in our commitment to improving outcomes for all students over time. The McKinsey and Company remind us that nationally the efforts of the pandemic are not temporary shocks easily erased in the next academic year. As Team BCPS, we need to remind ourselves that we have identified a lot of work to do through the compass prior to the pandemic. The far-reaching efforts of the pandemic have compounded many of our student community needs. We must maintain deliberate calm and remain focused on improved student performance for all. Grounded in our belief that we cannot make progress without application of equitable solutions, focus on both social emotional wellness and academics. We recognize a great opportunity to reimagine school from this experience lies ahead of us. The whole child is our priority and I applaud our staff for making social emotional learning and relationships a regular part of the work. The next few months will require all of us to keep health and safety at the forefront as we continue to navigate increased hybrid learning during a pandemic. Schools are continuing to ensure that all of our students, both in the classroom and at home choosing virtual learning, experience high quality teaching and learning in all classes. As they continue to innovate and work together with leadership teams to make decisions that best meet the needs of individual school communities in collaboration with our system offices, we believe the support and flexibility of our upcoming face-to-face re-engagement programs will be helpful in yielding successful outcomes towards efforts to re-engage and support students. Summer programs are coming to help support our students' needs in addition to a variety of professional learning opportunities to continue building the capacity of our staff to engage in this ongoing challenging work. This continues to be a challenging year, year filled with ever-changing conditions. The only thing that is constant is our students. They need all of us to work together on their behalf every day to help them succeed. I look forward to sharing additional updates in our future meetings. And with that, I wanna turn it over to the design team to provide an update on reopening. Great, thank you, Dr. Williams. So on behalf of the design team, um, we will provide just a brief update um, for the board this evening. Good evening to the board members. I'll open with a few um, comments reflective of where we left off at the last board meeting on March 23rd um, and opening this week on April 6th coming out of spring break. I'm gonna share a little bit of, our, um, of what I've seen in our schools in the East Zone late on the week before spring break and today. Um, Dr. Jones will also walk through some of the observations she's had from her West Zone visits to schools um, today and uh, the week going into spring break. And then Mrs. Byers will share some of the more detailed work of the design team moving forward over these next few weeks and what we expect our work to be as we move forward into late April and May. So as referenced, uh, the last board meeting on March 23rd, we did share with you um, an update, share with the board and the community an update on the design team and the reopening. And just as a reminder, that week of March 23rd was the first part of phase four's reentry. And what we had with that reentry was a transition for our sixth and ninth graders. So the design team has always felt that it was critical. Um, and as the research supports, it was critical that our transitioning students, um, in this case, our secondary sixth graders and ninth graders, had an opportunity to go to their middle schools and high schools by themselves um, in A and B cohorts 
to get the lay of the land, to meet their teachers, um, to have the building really in effect to themselves so they could get to know where their classes are, so they could walk through the building um, without the larger groups of the 7th and 8th graders or the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And what we've heard today from our school visits today, and I certainly can speak from our East Zone visits that my team and I visited in the secondary schools, that they were very grateful. The students were grateful for that. The parents were grateful for that. And certainly the teachers were grateful for that opportunity to have their 6th graders and their ninth graders' time to ease back into in-person and hybrid instruction. Last week or the week before spring break was also a very critical week because it provided that week of professional learning and that week of opportunity for the majority of our teachers to get back into the classroom to while continuing to instruct their students virtually to have that opportunity to set up their classrooms to create that welcoming environment that they do such an amazing job of doing in preparation for today so that week before spring break was a uh, another good week of allowing those teachers an opportunity that their colleagues had in phases one two and three uh, to prepare for instruction and prepare to welcome their students back so as we get to today um, coming out of spring break it was a wonderful day not just weather wise but it was a wonderful day to visit schools as dr williams mentioned he had an opportunity and our whole dssa team had an opportunity opportunity to visit schools today and welcoming back our um, third through fifth graders at the elementary level, our seventh and eighth graders at the middle school level, and our 10th, 11th, and 12th graders at the high school level. And what we saw really was a continuation of what we've been seeing and reporting and sharing with the board with phases one, two, and three were a lot of smiles. We could we imagine a lot of smiles under those faces, a lot of you know eyes getting smaller when kids are smiling. Um, I was referenced earlier um, in, in pre previously in this meeting. Um, we saw instruction going on, teachers really um, doing what they do best and, and managing their, their students on the screen while also working with their students who were in person, um, walking into the cafeteria during lunchrooms, certainly children um, not just eating their lunch but engaging and talking with one another, um, all mitigated and all with the appropriate distancing. Um, but it was really nice to see that environment coming back into the school for those kids, for the majority of our kids coming back in the A and B cohort. So just as important to note as well that our on-ramping, or we refer to it as our onboarding, our on-ramping process, will continue moving forward. We certainly received questions and we want to reassure the community that for those parents who choose to switch to an in-person environment, that they simply just need to notify their school, uh, just reach out to their assistant principal or the principal in their school, um, and they will be placed into the process to onboard and on-ramp into an onboarding process to make sure that the cohorts are balanced appropriately, that the mitigation strategies are prepared for appropriately as more students continue to come back. Um, so that process was established um, uh, months ago and continues to be implemented as we move forward with the hybrid process. And then lastly, what will continue to happen and what we're looking forward to happening in discussions with principals today and with teachers today is providing these group of teachers who, who now are teaching in a hybrid environment the same opportunity um, to have the time to learn to have the time that their teaching colleagues had in phases one, two, and three, because remember, this is really the first going into the second month of our phase one and two students who and teachers who returned at the beginning of March. Um, and what we've seen is really that growth in their teaching practice, that growth in that ability to teach in a hybrid environment. So we're looking forward to continuing to provide that support from our organizational effectiveness office, curriculum and instruction office, um, and our division of school support and achievement in supporting now our phase four teachers and providing them the same opportunity that we provided to their colleagues in phases one, two, and three, that time to get their feet wet, to really sink into the instruction and improve their practice in this whole new world of practice. So we're looking forward to supporting them over this next month as we have for our phase one, two, and three teachers in the month of March. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jones, who will speak a little bit about her visits in the West Zone. Dr. Jones? Thank you, Dr. Roberts, and good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to really discuss and reflect on the wonderful opportunities that we as Team BCPS are affording our students and families to participate in hybrid in hybrid learning. So in the West Zone, it was also a wonderful day today. In celebration of all of our assistant principals, we had the opportunity, Dr. Williams, myself, and our secondary executive director, Dr. Yarbrough, had the wonderful opportunity to visit Woodlawn High School and Southwest Academy. And at both of those schools, it was just fascinating to see the teamwork from the teachers to the cafeteria staff to the um, school support personnel to the principal, the admin teams, just everyone working together in service of, of in service of students and really having kind of those deep conversations about what is happening system wide 
in regard to hybrid learning, but then also what's happening school by school. And it's so um, it's so interesting. And we have those opportunities just to hear the stories that our families have shared with us. And it was just a pleasure to visit those schools today with Dr. Williams. My team and I have been in um, at out and about and visiting schools as well. Last week leading up to the week leading up to um, spring break, had the opportunity to visit schools within feeder patterns, visited um, Deer Park Middle School, Deer Park Elementary School, some schools within the Randallstown feeder pattern, Lansdowne area. And we're just making our way around to the various areas to really show and demonstrate support. Our DSSA team, as Dr. Roberts said, has visited schools today just to be able to let our teachers, who are our, our heroes, really, in this work, to let them know that we support them as they support our students in providing this hybrid learning and this hybrid experience. So as a design team, those of us who are on the design team who are constantly thinking about health and safety, school system and operations, and of course, the instructional model, we are very excited that today has come. And we're also excited about the opportunities to expand hybrid learning. I'll now turn it over to Ms. Byers just to share a little bit more about Central Zone and the work of our design team. Ms. Byers. So thank you, Dr. Jones, and good evening, everyone. Um, as you can tell, our excitement is a little bit contagious. Um, we are in the business of children, so it's always good when we get to be in schools and see our students uh, doing the work. Um, similar to my colleagues, um, it was an exciting day in the central zone today. I had an opportunity to visit two of our elementary schools and one of our middle schools. And um, just to echo some of the comments, uh, the teamwork at the school level has been remarkable. Um, teachers, administrators, support staff, paraeducators, uh, our food service workers, our building service workers, all so happy to welcome back our students, but really working together to do something brand new. Um, some of the feedback that I got while I was in buildings today was really about the appreciation to our very deliberate pace um, in welcoming back our students. Um, because we've never done this before, it really allowed our leadership teams at the school level, many of our schools um, developed their own reopening teams, and it allowed them to implement some of the practices that were part of their school-based reopening plans, um, look at what really worked and what maybe they wanted to tweak, and then they were able to do that. They were afforded that opportunity to make any of those tweaks and revisions before welcoming back the next wave of students. Um, when I was in a middle school today, we talked about how great it was the week before spring break for our sixth grade learners to have the building all to themselves for those two days. They came in really bright-eyed, um, but, you know, never having been in the building, did not necessarily know where to go or the routines, and it really gave um, the staff in the school the opportunity to kind of wrap their arms around those students to make sure that they felt safe and welcomed. And so, again, it has been, um, it's been exciting Um we're hearing great reports coming out of transportation um, and students really uh, um, arriving to school um, excited. Our wonderful bus drivers, you know, the first people who often greet our students are doing a tremendous job. Our students are getting off the bus prepared, happy, and having a great start to their day. Um, so just looking forward, as we discussed at the board meeting right before the break, uh, the design team is currently um, working on analyzing what an expansion of in-person learning would look like for our students. We are really looking at that and analyzing that through the lens of the three pillars of our reopening plan, which as you all know, include health and safety, uh, system and school operations, and our instructional model. Um, one of the things we have been looking at in terms of that potential to expand is um, in alignment with what the research and, and what the science is telling us um, in that when we're looking to uh, potentially expand in-person opportunities, we do need to look at that 
um, through the lens of our youngest learners and our most academically vulnerable learners. And so that is where we are right now. Um, as we discussed before our break, we will be coming back to the board at our next board meeting on April 20th with some preliminary uh, findings and some information regarding how we can potentially expand to more in-person dates. So with that, uh, this does conclude our brief update on reopening because um, we did want to allow Dr. Williams to spend some time on academic achievement. So I will turn things back over to um, Madam Chairwoman Scott and Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so now I will open the floor to any questions. Um, looks like Ms. Causey, did you have a question? I'm reading the chat. Ms. Causey, did you have a question or no? Um, not yet. Not yet? Okay. I believe Ms. All right. Pastor we can is already... Uh, Okay, up. it looks like uh, there's a question from Ms. Pastor. Yes, please go ahead, Ms. Pastor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Williams and Community Soups uh, for your presentation. Um, I'm just going to run some questions just so I can get the answers. Um, you talked about the supports um, that you shared with the schools. What do you see as being different in terms of supports now that you have some students back live as well as the teachers, but you're working at your teachers are now working in a hybrid situation, having to now teach and focus on those children who are still home while they are focusing on those who are um, um, face to face elementary schools, they often have um, a support, a para um, professional, but in high schools, middle schools, um, that is generally not the case. Also, um, how are you going to use be right before the pandemic, the um, compass came out and you were talking about um, uh, the core instructional team. So you've identified those schools that we've all been concerned about that um, have shown in the past, prior to the pandemic, um, some very serious needs. So will that kick in? You never had a chance to do it. So will that kick in? Um, and, and how will that look during this period as they're coming back in? I'm listening to a, a couple of the parents talking, um, uh, particularly one of the last ones, what will look different for those students who do have IEPs 504s who were in self-contained? Some of them, of course, having done better under virtual and some needing to come back. So how is that uh, going to look different? Thank you. Those are my questions, if I can get some responses. So Good evening, Ms. Pastor. Um, I will start us off. You had a lot in there, um, but I can start us off with the instructional core team around the schools that we've identified as needing differentiated supports. We have been doing that throughout this entire year, even during virtual learning and in the pandemic. Um, our Division of School Support and Achievement, um, our executive directors and uh, Dr. Jones, Dr. Roberts and I have a biweekly cross-division meeting with our colleagues, um, and we identify those supports that schools need, whether those supports, um, it, they're primarily professional learning supports for our staff. Our goal is always to increase teacher capacity, knowing that the research says that when you increase the capacity of the adults, you see the outcomes in the students. So we have been doing that all year. Um, those targeted schools have received support um, in academic content areas, as well as supports from the social emotional learning side. So we didn't pause that because of the pandemic. Thanks. Ms. Pastor, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I can just put one of your questions around. Thank you. I couldn't get off mute. Thank you. Okay. 
I'm sorry, go ahead. No, absolutely, Mr. Pesci, I can address one small part of your question around what we see as in terms of support for teachers based on what we're seeing in the classrooms. And I was just having this conversation today with one of, uh, with one of our principals in the Northeast. What we've seen really is a progression with teachers, starting with phase one and, and coming now online with fully with phase four is really a lot of this for teachers particularly at the secondary level, is not the design of the lesson itself and the content. They know content. It's this new environment, as Ms. Byron mentioned, is how do I teach you know, 10 or a dozen children in front of me, but I also have another dozen in front of for the computer, which I think is what your question was asking. So what we see and what we have seen with phase one and what we're really seeing again with phase four is on the very first day in the first couple of days is that initial um, teachers kind of teaching the way they've been teaching in the virtual environment. So what we're trying to do when providing them strategies through organizational effectiveness and curriculum and instruction and through our team is really, and teachers who have already been teaching in this hybrid environment, is something as simple as where do you stand, right? Because all the computers have cameras. So now when you're teaching in a hybrid environment with kids in front of you and kids in the computer, where you stand matters um, and how your voice project matters um, in, a, in a more succinct way because you want your children virtually and your children in person to be able to see you to have that engaging instruction. So it's really sometimes as little as that that we're seeing um, in terms of the ask of us is to what strategies and what learning can we provide to teachers to get them to a point because what we have been seeing and this is the great news is as teachers get into the end of the first week and into the second week um, and we heard this a lot from our phase one and two teachers the comfort level went up and they now really harness that creativity that they naturally have as teachers and they're able to work through some of this really new teaching because this is so new for them um, that it takes them a little bit of time. And that's what Mrs. Byers and I were mentioning a little bit earlier in our comments, is that we wanna make sure we provide that really deliberate approach to this phased in um, hybrid instruction to allow our teachers that flexibility and time to really catch up and ask for what they need. So I just wanted to address that other small part of your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. Pasture, I will talk about our self-contained special education students. You know, just it actually very much um, will echo what uh, Dr. Roberts just said in that, you know, as our teachers have transitioned and our students have transitioned back to in-person, we now have that opportunity to take advantage of instructional methods um, that we were not able to previously, like the types of manipulatives we're able to, to work with students in person. And again, just as Dr. Roberts said, as our teachers and our students are transitioning back in and sort of um, working through that gradual transition of we had been sort of teaching in this virtual format, now we're teaching in a concurrent format for any students that may still remain virtual. And so we see that skill set and that sort of um, uh, evolving practice um, as as everyone becomes more familiar with the end person. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me just add a couple of points. Um, so thank you, design team. Um, Ms. Pasture, I just want you and the other board members to know the ICT, the instructional core team, is a process. It is not a labeling, not that you said this. I just want to clarify. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, is it thank you. But you sorry, have, sorry, we were getting some, he wasn't right. finished, Ms. Pesto, we were getting some feedback. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I think it was me, Mr. Corns. Anyway, the ICT is a process. It's the process of central office uh, coordinating the support with the school staff. And as we speak, uh, I was already talking to the team. We're about continuous improvement. So we experimented with bringing offices together, as you recalled, I talked about the infamous silos and in bringing office together. The feedback from the school staff was very important for us, and they said they liked the focus areas, they liked the support, and it was coordinated. As we are speaking, we're looking at a upgrade to our ICT process. I'm calling it the ICT 2.0 process. And the second point I wanna raise as I visited schools, just like board members have visited schools, you're hearing these scenarios about how the online is working for s some students. So the charge is how we're going to capitalize on what options we can provide during the summer, next school year. I'm gonna be careful with my words, to continue some of those ways 
uh, to provide alternatives for students, particularly those students that our staff members, our principals, our parents are saying they're seeing success. Again, it may not be for all students, but I do want to capitalize on where it is working and how do we provide some additional options for our students and families. So um, Dr. Boswell McComish, she has a laundry list of things to do. She's a, a good player, but we are looking at some additional ways to support our, our, our students. So I just want to offer those two additional points. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Next, it looks like it's Ms. Smack. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Scott. I have four questions. The first has to do with academic achievement. In 2019, um, the Maryland Report Card reported that 66.4% of our 10th graders were not proficient in ELA. Those same 10th graders are presumably graduating um, this year. What specific steps are we taking to ensure that our 2021 graduates have the skills that they need to succeed in career and or college? So I'll begin, and, and, and the team can add on. I just want to bring to the board's attention the state assessment or the Maryland report card is looking at the state assessment as the driving factor. I want to go back to my conversation about college and career readiness. I want to go back to my previous conversation or my presentation about rigor. And so keep in mind, this was a point in which our students uh, performed during that time period as 10th graders. However, during that time, their additional years, if they are now seniors, looking at are they college and career ready? What kind of assessments have they taken related to the SAT, ACT, or even ACCUPLACER? Um, what are our students doing in terms of any AP or IB courses and exams and trying to push more students to not only enroll in an AP course, but also take an exam uh, related, related to that course. Uh, so keep in mind that as we're looking at the one data point or the Maryland report card, we are also looking at the ways in which our, our students are performing in various courses and how they're performing on national assessments, as well as what our schools are doing to really meet the needs. As you recall, one of the board goals was to lessen the number of bridge plans. Again, uh, that was the draft goal. So let me put draft in front of that because the full board just will have to uh, codify those goals. But that was one goal that you had an interest in in terms of bridge plans. So Ms. Mack, we want to lessen um, that work. But the, the, the bottom line to get better success on the state assessment as indicated by MCAP, is making sure our students are having um, access to rigorous courses, whether it's on grade level or is our GT honors or AP. And also, we want to make sure uh, that our staff are teaching to the standard. And again, this year and the end of last year, we were dealing with a pandemic. Um, but it's, it is a part of that work when I mention the two system improvement teams, the one is in reading. Um, and we can always, we will follow up with the board about the recommendations of the system improvement team, but making sure our students are reading by grade three and having access to the, to the rigor and to the standards of the course. And also there's a second group looking at our math curriculum as well as our Algebra 1 preparation. When we talk about Algebra 1, the goal is Algebra 1 by eighth grade with a C or higher, but we also have to look at what's happening prior to Algebra 1 or eighth grade. What's happening in fifth grade? What's happening sixth and seventh grade? So I would say as we look at data, we should look at the totality of data. As I presented tonight, I presented more of the national um, how our students are doing, and we still have work to be done. That was much of the conversation when I presented my first budget to the board and to the community. But I will pause and see if any, um, if Dr. McComas or others would like to add to this. Uh, 
Dr. Williams, I would like to follow up um, to my comment, please. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Hill. Um, Excuse me, I like apologize, Ms. Mack. Dr. Williams, I appreciate the fact that um, MCAP is just one assessment, but when 66.4% of our 10th graders who are now seniors are not proficient in reading um, pre-COVID, that gives me great pause as to whether or not our students are truly prepared to go out into the world. And that was the reason for my question. So let me and just I, clarify I, one thing, Ms. Mack. It is proficient based on a test score. And again, as we work to improve our students to be college and career readiness, by having that data point as 10th graders, there's an opportunity to work with our students so they are uh, deemed college and career ready and can go off to military, two-year program, four-year program. And so uh, I think what we'll continue to do is to help the board to understand about the MCAP and the one data point. Um, but your point is well taken. At that point in time, our seniors who were 10th graders scored on this one assessment a particular score, but there's been questions about the cutoff score, whether that is commiserate of whether students are really proficient at English language arts or mathematics. But I understand and appreciate your comment and question. Thank you. I'll move to my next question. Um, due to the bandwidth problem that it was experienced today, teachers were advised that students in classrooms did not need to log into Google Meet. Um, how can we be sure? Do all schools have the equipment required to teach concurrently when in-person students can't log into Google Meets? So I, I won't answer the bandwidth question. That's not my area of expertise. But from being in the classroom, um, the, the students who are in person do not necessarily need to be. They don't need to be in the Google Meet because they are in the classroom. So the Google Meet is really the opportunity for the students who are virtual during that concurrent instruction to be able to receive that first instruction, direct instruction from the teacher. The kids in the classroom can see the teacher. And so they don't need to be in the Google Meet at that time all at the same time. Um, kids are accessing Google Meet concurrently when they are doing group work or when they're in small groups, but during the actual concurrent instructional portion where the teacher is delivering the information, delivering that direct instruction, um, they don't need to be simultaneously logged in. And the students in the classroom who are face-to-face -face can hear the students who answer virtually and vice versa because of the equipment in the room. Thank you. I'll ask my last question. Um, what discussions, if any, has BCPS had with county or state health departments specific to the COVID variant B.1.1.7 and its potential increased risk to kids? So thank you, uh, Ms. Mack. I will um, tee it up for Dr. Zarchin, but I just want to bring to the board's attention that we meet weekly as a COVID task force with our uh, partners in the Baltimore County Health Department. Um, we have Dr. Branch to join us during our cabinet meeting, in which today he raised uh, these topics, and we have our health advisory. But Dr. Zarchin, if you can give uh, some particulars about the discussion regarding health as Ms. Mack raised her question. I'll be happy to, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, this, this morning, at uh, this afternoon in our cabinet meeting, we had Dr. Branch on, and that is something that he is monitoring very carefully, um, all the variants um, and the impact on the state of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the potential um, to impact our students and staff. Um, that is something we continue to monitor. Um, I'm going to turn it to Deb Somerville at this point to give the uh, perspective from nurses and contact tracing. But the, the key to this is working with the Department of Health um, and, and our ongoing conversations with them. Uh, Ms. Somerville. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. Um, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question. 
question, and it is something that's on the top of our mind as we watch the data. Um, the best estimates that I see coming from um, from national groups is that uh, the variants will be the predominant strains that will be seen by the end of April and may be accounting for some of the increases that we're seeing in um, in COVID. Um, so we're going to continue to watch it. And honestly, you know, with a pandemic and a new a new virus, what we need to do the most is monitor our data and look look to other parts of the world as they've you know experienced these and uh, responded appropriately. So um, you know we'll be looking to what's been done in UK and talking to our experts at Hopkins. Um, and University of Maryland to make sure that we're right on top of best practices, as well as our, our Dr. Chen um, at the health department is really keyed in on that. His advice, he issued us some advice um, over the weekend to use caution for our non-public schools to use caution in adopting three feet immediately after spring break. And he urged um, schools in Baltimore County to proceed cautiously while watching the data as we kind of watch to see what's happening in April. So I can reassure you that we are right on top of it, um, but I can't tell you for sure what it's what we'll what we'll know in two weeks. It's just a day to day, week to week kind of thing. I appreciate that information. I have one more follow up question. A parent brought to my attention that she received a letter from her son's school that as a result of him being on a team, he had exposure to COVID. And I believe she checked to see that only children on the team received that exposure letter. However, the student is attending in-person school. And I do not believe that the rest of the students in the classroom with that student, nor did that student receive an exposure letter. Um, what is the process that we use for notifying kids who are on a team who also may be exposing kids in the classroom? Very good question. Thank you for that. And that has uh, been a great deal of the work that our nurses have been doing, um, looking at close contact and doing the contact tracing. Uh, again, I'm going to uh, ask Ms. Somerville to share the details um, on, on the work that they're doing and notification. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. So when we're doing contact tracing, as you know, it's per, we're looking to prevent school transmission by making sure who, persons who are contagious um, are not in the schoolhouse. And that's kind of two ways. First, we make sure that a person who is positive gets the appropriate um, advice per the CDC and Maryland Department of Health about timelines for return, and we provide them that support. And the second part is identifying and quarantining persons who had close contact. And we define close contact as being within six feet for 15 or more cumulative minutes. Um, so there's an interview process that goes on with students. Um, we talk to older students. We talk to staff that we're supervising to identify any potential persons who were within close contact. And the first thing we do, Ms. Mack, is we verbally notify any, any parent of a student and any staff member who has close contact. So that's the first step that we do in Baltimore County Schools is, is it's not a letter, it's a phone call and we make sure we talk to them. The second layer is once we've achieved, identified all close contacts, we do a general community notice to make people aware that there was a case. That community notice only goes out when there was a case in the building during the time the person was infectious. And it only goes, or it always goes, to the persons that were involved in that those activities. So kind of we make it broad enough that we don't identify the person, but we make it target enough that, that it has relevance to those persons who receive it. Um, so in the case that I think you're probably talking about or the situation, our student athletes tend to be back in the school before their grade band has returned to, to in person. And so sometimes as we worked with principals to identify who was the target group that had um, general exposure, not high, cl not close contact, but general exposure or could have been in the building at the same time, they might have sent it to one or multiple athletic teams. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. 
Yes, hi. Um, thank you. So I have um, a comment, a request, and two questions. So I'm going to talk really fast. Um, I just want to say that I, I feel like I watched two completely different presentations. On one hand, Dr. Williams shared this McKinsey report that came out in, the, in June of 2020 that predicted disparities in learning loss related to not being in school buildings. And then we heard about this great appreciation for our very deliberate pace and returning our kids to school after being out for 13 months. Um, and today is the day that most kids returned. And I just feel like we we heard about the kids kids failing at, at high rates and the disparities and failures in attendance rec attendance right now. Um, and then a very glowing report about returning to school again after 13 months. And so I, I found the, the juxtaposition of the two different presentations a little bit alarming, just because we are facing a really serious issue with learning loss. Um, and so with that, I, I do have two questions. Um, the first is that Dr. Williams said, despite our best efforts, there we, we see these kids failing at higher rates than normal. Um, and again, these disparities that we're seeing and that we need resources um, to help help these kids out. Um, what resources do you need? What can the school board do to support um, the schools and the school system in helping to provide resources? What are those resources that you need? So thank you, Dr. Hager. So when I was referring to the resources, it was teeing up to what I shared before about um, the kinds of supports whether it is um, extended day, whether it's additional programming, whether it's extended time, whether it's um, continuing the work that we are trying to do, as uh, Dr. Uh, Boswell McComas shared about our plans for the summer as well as in the fall. The, the other additional resources um, will be about our programming, as I mentioned, um, right now, the pandemic, as we visit schools, the, the, the principals and the administrative teams are just talking about the fear uh, that exists out there or the loss that our own students and staff members have experienced. So um, as, as I shared, we're looking at many of our uh, resources such as our CARES funds to continue to provide some additional support as we mentioned about summer programs or extended learning where it will be offered to students. We're looking at not charging. We're looking at doing other additional supports. The other resource um, is around this whole phenomenon of online learning and why we are seeing some success uh, with our students, but students cannot, and Dr. McComas will correct me, students cannot continue to matriculate and then get a high school diploma having only done online learning. And that's the, the uh, additional resource or support um, that many of the school systems of Maryland are exploring with our, with our state superintendent. Um, so right now, uh, the resource and the people here, the, the other piece is the human capital. Our, our teachers are doing a phenomenal job in managing hybrid, those who are teaching online, but the other resources is that we still need, as we continue, we need the bodies. Um, visiting one of our schools today, I won't say the name, but it was a positive that we were able to really uh, capitalize on our paraeducators and our profession, uh, paraprofessionals to support uh, when there is a need to have additional, uh, additional person in the classroom or if there is a need for coverage or substitute. Uh, that has been helpful to provide that resource that we may have been limited before. And so I, I think this is going to be an ongoing conversation about the needs is really getting to what every school may need, because every school has been operating differently because every school community was impacted differently with COVID. So that comment actually takes me to my request, which would be to have comparison data, because I, I acknowledge that every school is different, but at the same time, the whole country has been in this situation um, with, and responses have been different as well. And so if we can compare our, how our kids are doing compared to other, other school systems in Maryland, comparing to ourselves from the 18-19 school year, some degree of comparison data I think would be really helpful. 
Sure, you know, as we created the strategic plan, we talked about looking at ourselves, comparing our, ourselves with others, and looking at the state as well as national. Um, and so I, I think that's something as we can continue down the road to provide some kind of comparison of how we look. But keep in mind, every system has been impacted differently um, because it's, it's in addition to the achievement, it's the pandemic. And for us, we have an additional area, which was the um, cyber attack. And, and, and so we'll be, we, I think it's healthy to, for us to kind of compare. You know, we, we, we can be a little competitive, want to know what's happening in the, dis, in the system next door. But yes, I think that's something as we continue to look at our data to kind of compare and contrast where we are with other local or maybe even national systems that's comparable to our size and our demographics. Definitely. Um, last question, the four days a week, I was under the impression last meeting that that was happening, that in May, elementary school students were going back four days a week. Um, and then I heard tonight that we're working on analyzing an expansion through our three pillars and kind of on and on. I get the impression that it might not happen. So I, again, the CDC guidance was clear about three feet. What's the holdup in getting kids back in four days a week? I'll just say briefly, um, hearing from our health partners, it was a little bit of a, an area about spring break, coming back from spring break and, and allowing just to see what those numbers are looking like for the, for the next two weeks. But uh, I think right now, as the design team said, we, we are looking at our younger learners or our students who may need additional support. Uh, a lot of it is working uh, with our families, working with our staff, and working with logistics. But um, uh, what you heard was we didn't want to put a, a specific time on it yet as we kind of navigate what these upcoming two weeks look like just coming back from spring break. So I apologize if you heard a little bit of a disconnect in our presentation, but the, the conversation we had with Dr. Branch, as, as Michael Zarchin shared, was just a little bit of an eye-opening experience that, that, experience that they, they really want us to, to kind of watch and see where our numbers, and if you're looking at the county, there's some concerns when you look at the aggregate as well as start looking at different communities and populations, so. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Yep. Yes, next is Mr. Mahomza. Yes, um, I wanted to quickly go back to Ms. Uh, Max's question, uh, and I just had a follow up. Um, I know that for those students who don't, um, pass uh, some of the MCAP exams, they're put into the bridge courses or given bridge materials. And I was one wondering, is there um, data to show how effective those courses are? I don't know if you've been on it. So if I understand your question and how effective the bridge plan programs are, I think that will be a follow-up that we have to look at. Okay. Uh, has there been previous data on it? I know I think it's been here for a while, so I was just curious if it's they've ever studied that. So without the data in front of me, I know last year when we were looking at our strategic plan, and and that was a question or questions from the board about our bridge plan. Uh, we saw. I don't. I'm gonna speak in general. As we saw students. Um, being successful in our bridge plans, but I do not have the data in front of me to give specifics, but that could be a follow-up. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I'm, I don't know, if, my next question, I don't know if you mentioned, mentioned this or uh, talked about this before, um, but I was curious to know, uh, are, is BCPS or at least um, individual schools um, going to do some type of campaign similar to the one we did for teachers in terms of like vaccinations and giving them information uh, for students. I, and I don't know if we're hosting um, drives or other nearby drives, but giving that information to students, especially um, the high schoolers who qualify for vaccines. 
So I think that's a good point. And, and Dr. Zarcher and Deb Somerville, any thoughts around, around that? Hi, this is Debbie. Yep. <laughs> Dr. Zarchin, you on? Go ahead, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, that's a great, that is an excellent point. And yes, now that we have opened up down to age 16 in Maryland for vaccine, I think it is really important for our school nurses to make sure that our, our high school students do have the best information about about the vaccine, the benefits, the risks, and um, how they can sign up for a vaccine. I think in the short term, we don't have plans to administer it at school. We usually work with our health department. Um, as they have that vaccine availability, we would be more than willing to work on a vaccine program at schools if and when that's something that um, we have a supply and that's part of the health department's distribution plan. So absolutely, great idea. Um, is that it? Okay, um, so my last question is, uh, I, I received a message from uh, a graduating senior that they had received a letter from their principal saying that um, they were in danger of not graduating because of um, not, com not meeting um, the, the state requirements when I believe one of the, and the requirement was the, uh, the test, one of the um, Senate tests. Uh, and I was curious to know, um, how did, the this, the recent decision about moving um, standardized tests to the fall, how's that going to affect seniors, especially those who um, might be missing an exam or two and were um, planning to take them um, during the spring? Would that be uh, excused? So if I understood so, this correctly, and I'll, I will turn it over to the community superintendent, one of our processes that we have is to provide warning letters and if and which is a good thing just to say to our seniors you know let's let's do a double check you're you may be missing a course you may be missing some some hours and if i recall the date the those letters went out in march before the state board made a decision on march 25th and so mm -hmm. Just like last year, we were providing updates uh, every so often when we've heard from our, our state board as to what's being waived and what's being required. And um, because these are seniors, if they have the right courses, um, again, those assessments, they would not be expected to come back in the fall. But your question about the fall administration is the question that I think all of our superintendents have currently about if we are not having a state assessment this year and there's a schedule that will happen in the fall, we yeah. have several logistical questions about that, as well as which students would be those who would be assessed. Um, and as soon as we understand some information, we will definitely share it. But at this point, the logistics and those next steps I just don't have since that decision was made on March 25th. Yeah, no, let me clarify a little bit. I, I, I didn't mean that um, are we giving opportunities for testing in the fall. I was thinking that if um, they have been postponed by the state for the spring, I would assume that that requirement and they would proceed graduating. That would be re that would be correct if, in fact, they are meeting the uh, credit requirements, um, just to make sure they have the necessary credits uh, in order to graduate. And will principals? Your time, them? Josh. Sure. Thank you. I'm sure Dr. Williams can definitely follow up with emails for any questions. Sure. Um, so next is Miss Causey. Excuse me, is your microphone on? Can't hear you. I'm starting over. Um, this is the document that is on our website related to parents and students choosing in-person instruction. Ms. Byers, if you could um, 
explain the timeline of uh, coming to the board on April 20th and discussing a plan. What does that mean specifically about students getting back into the buildings and will that table no longer apply? I can't see what you're holding up. I'm sorry. I can't see it either. I don't see it either. No. I can't see sorry. anything, Ms. Posse. So sorry. We still see the presentation. I just see the PowerPoint. So the question is about, as we had given families a, a window to request mm -hmm. to go from uh, virtual to in-person, um, I think what I heard the question is, okay, there we go. So how does this fit into a plan or proposal coming up okay. in April to look at additional time f for students? Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, so what we're, what we're discussing, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't see it at first. Um, what we're discussing right now is actually using that process um, in order to just fold in a parent's election to go, um, if it's four days, four days a week. And so rather than have to um, go th through an entire new survey process, we all already have a mechanism by school. Um, so that form that I, I think you were referencing appears on every school's website. And so we would just um, specifically, if we're talking about elementary school, we would tweak that form for our elementary schools to put on their websites. So we would use um, a very similar process as opposed to having to come back around and do an entire, uh, an entirely new questionnaire. Because that, that, the result of that data from that form um, goes directly to the school principal. And then our school principals are able to work with transportation, their teachers, their master schedulers, whomever they need to, in order to make sure that all requests can be accommodated. You're muted, Ms. Causey. How does that relate exactly to timing and phasing and all students versus some students? So, so I think if I understand your question, Ms. Cause it relates to the students in terms of what you see on that chart. It's a, it's a, that chart was designed as a phased in approach. So as we were having students phased in, we also had a parallel process, what you have in your hand, to allow parents who change their mind to come on board. So if, right, so if we use that process and we build off that process, and this is what the design team is working on now, what you're holding in your hand would allow a continuation now that we have all four phases in, but it would allow parents to, as Ms. Byer said, make that decision based on when they would want their child to come in, if that makes sense. So we wanted to provide flexibility to parents to make that decision because some, some and we see it now, some have decided over the past five weeks that, hey, I do want my child in. Some have decided to pull their child out. So that, what you have in your hand, allows that flexibility for principals as they move through for all phases, K through 12. So all phases would have the opportunity to do four days in person at the same time. All right, well, that's not what we're saying now. We're saying that's what we're working on now. What we're saying is that process you have in your hands is what we've started discussing preliminarily around instead of creating a new process, that if we were as a system to move to what you just shared, we have a process in place to accommodate that. But we're certainly not saying at this point based on what we're shared earlier and what we're talking about now that, that we're moving in direction because we have a lot to consider as we go to that. We're just saying a process is in place if that's the direction that um, after consultation and discussion we're moving forward. And, and um, just to respond to your WHO question, as we stated, um, we are going to begin with our youngest learners in terms of um, expanding to four days a week. Um, we'd be looking at our youngest learners and then our most academically vulnerable learners. Okay, I'm going to shift gears here. Um, this is Stephen Covey's worst nightmare, trying to choose between the what is priority but also what is urgent. Uh, related to academic achievement, 
what has evaluation has been done of the MSDE um, compilation related to failure rates, first term and second term? So as a system, beginning last year and working with our school principals is to look at the success of our students and to look at the data in the disaggregated way, not only our curriculum-based assessments, but also our quarter grades. Um, as, and, and then we created more work to look at certain focus areas. So as a system, um, there's always been this focus about how to improve um, the performance of our students, but looking at each school and what our principals are seeing, is it the fact, that could be a variety of reasons, um, the fidelity of the curriculum. So you have heard me discuss many times, there is the written curriculum, then there's the taught curriculum, and there's the assessed curriculum. That's been our work. When I entered, that was the work. There was great need to get better outcomes for students. And the team, the central office team and school principals have been wonderful about, yes, we have recognized, we, as Dr. McComas has always shared, the math audit, looking at the written curriculum. Now looking at the taught curriculum, which led us to our coordinated supports with instructional core team going in and saying and sitting with the leadership team, principal and leadership team, what do you need? We're seeing, we're seeing something, but what are you seeing it? And really talking to our schools and working with them. So there's always been the work to try to lessen the number of students who are uh, not receiving a passing score. But in addition to the work that we're doing, and I've shared this in a previous uh, presentation, we see that the relationship between school and home has to be strengthened. And, and what are the potential barriers with that? And I don't mean just, and I always get myself in trouble when I say that, I don't mean showing up for a meeting, but how do we engage our families, not only in the different languages, but also looking at the different needs. So uh, there has always been work at the school level, which, gets, which leads right into our school progress plans. Every school has had a progress plan, school progress plan, looking at mathematics, looking at English language arts, and there was always the other piece around the climate whether it's the climate, as you just asked, about how do we get more students to be successful, how do we get more kids engaged, how do we get more kids active, or to look at how do we lessen certain behaviors in the halls, in the classroom. And so the work has been ongoing. We've had this extra layer of a challenge um, dealing with what we're facing with to address um, the needs of our students. Hence. Uh, when meeting with our principals and meeting with our central office is to think differently, what more might, we, might you do at the school level that we can support that will help build um, success in our students or help to continue that success in the students? Another case that happened this past year, we turned to our, 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 our principals and said, let's look at scheduling for an example. And as you know, we had some schools that modified their schedule from a seven period day to a, a four by four. So uh, we're working collaboratively with our school leadership to help address these issues. But I think um, we can do what we can, but I also see that, that power of that partnership with our school communities, with our, with our families to meet the additional uh, needs of our schools. I think it's, it was most telling when you visit schools and you have conversations with the principals and you hear their stories and you hear about what students are saying to them about what, what our own students have dealt with for the last year. It, it's, it's far beyond just the academics. Um, and, and that is why we're so thankful that our our teams have worked r real hard to provide that extra touch and support regarding to our SEL work. 
Um, I just wanted to share that, Ms. Causey, as you raised that question. This, is, this has been an ongoing work for all of us um, pre-pandemic and now, and it will continue as we try to build additional supports and look at different programming for our students. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams, for that response. And as you know, and I'll remind everyone else, when the board hired you, your uh, part of the process was analyzing the data to see the gaps, to see the disparities, to see uh, the positives, and to see the areas for improvement. I was speaking more to, and I believe in the work of the Compass. Um, again, that was part of the um, goals that the board had for you, and, and it got done despite the uh, pandemic. Um, but I was speaking more to the urgency of the decisions in front of us, especially as the MSDE related attendance with uh, the same report with failures. The challenge is the pandemic in every community and how it's been impacting our students and, and our families. We're not going to continue. We're going to continue our focus on getting our students connected getting them engaged, getting them to do well. However, we also have to work, and we've been working with our attendance committees, our PPWs, and so MSD provided the aggregate. I'm looking at each school, all 175 schools, and what our principals are doing in trying to manage that there are some challenges, even greater challenges, that our students are facing, and we're we're, we have to work collaboratively with our families and figure out how best to address these issues. And so let me just correct something. The work that I did my first year was to look at the additional data and to say that we were operating on a strategic plan that was outdated and that needed to be addressed. And I, I, I want to thank the staff, our communities, our teachers, our administrators for providing that feedback. And so when we presented it to the board, I, I, I felt it was a good plan because we not only had internal input, we also got feedback from our external partners. And so that plan was developed last year um, and then COVID hit. And so we're gonna continue to, to, to address why aren't our students in, engaged like we did last spring last summer with our re-engagement programs the same thing we're doing now to try to get to the root um, it's really a root cause analysis looking at what's causing these outcomes what what are those barriers and how do we address the barriers we will do our part i know our families will do their part i know our school leaders would do their part but i think that's going to be an ongoing conversation looking at each of our schools and how they've been impacted differently during this year uh, as we experience COVID. Thank you for that response. I'm going to reserve my time. Next is Ms. Rowe. Hi, yes, um, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'd like to know, as we're looking at the disease metrics and the CDC guidance, um, if you could speak to, it looks like we're in the red and if that's impacting expanding to four days or expanding in-person learning at all, or if it's only the six feet or three feet guidance. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, Deb Somerville, Mike Sarchin, you wanna to respond to that? Thank you, I'm glad to. So we are carefully monitoring the metrics. Right now we are in high transmission uh, since March 16th, we have continued to go up in total cases per 100,000 and uh, the seven day percent positivity rate. On the 16th with the positivity rate, we were a 4.9. Currently, or our latest, which came out last week, we were at an 8.1. Looking at total cases per 100,000 on the 16th, we were at 118 we are currently at 195. So the next two weeks, uh, we believe are gonna be very critical uh, in our next steps, what we do with expanding, um, looking at where we've been successful in slowing the spread and our mitigation practices. Um, 
we're really we're taking a careful approach. We're watching. We're trying to learn, seeing where we've been successful and where we need to shore things up. Um, I'll let Ms. Somerville um, add from there, but we continue to monitor. It is not stopping what we're doing, um, but we want to be careful as we move forward and expand. Ms. Somerville. Thanks, Dr. Zarchin. I don't really have much to add. Um, I, I can, you know, it's it, they, they, they. We have to watch the the numbers, and they are right now trending in the wrong direction. And so we have to be really careful that what we do is is really truly evidence based based on the emergence of variants and what we are learning about variants. So I think it's it's a it's a big picture look, and it's it's a cautious look, but it's it's informed. Okay, and. Can you tell me um, if bridge plans have been waived for this year and a student has not passed a given high school assessment, uh, can the student still graduate? Mr. I will um, attempt to answer that question. I, my understanding is if they have passed the course, so Typically, students have to pass a course and then pass the state assessment, and the state assessment could be in the form of a normal standardized test, or they could complete the performance assessment if they have not been successful on the standardized test. Um, and with those waivers, my understanding is a student still has to, of course, pass the class. Okay. And um, has have attendance standards been waived for graduates as well? That I will have to look at, Ms. Um, Rowe. I'm sorry, I, I had the, the testing pieces on my head. I will look at that and see if I can find that out for you before um, I just, I'm going to have to pull up and see what I can research for you real quick. Hi, good okay. evening, Dr. So Basil McCombs. This is talk? Dr. Phillip. We do have oh, Ms. Great. Stacey Shack, our Director of Assessment. She's on the call, and she certainly can provide clarification regarding um, the questions that have been asked. So, Ms. Shack, could you jump in? Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Um, for our seniors or any student who's going to graduate in 2020-2021, as long as they, as Dr. McComas said, as long as they have passed the course, they will meet the testing requirement. Um, in terms of attendance, there have not been any waivers presented to the State Board of Education regarding attendance requirements. Okay. Is it is it possible for a student to pass a course and not have adequate attendance? I mean, at what point, if a student isn't showing up, can they not pass the course? I think that question really would lie with each individual building and the classroom teacher's expectations that they have set for their classroom. Um, and I see Ms. Byers is, is here to provide additional clarification regarding that. There's a state piece in terms of assessments and what, what, are, what is required, but then each individual building and each classroom, um, those teachers set the rules and expectations. Ms. Byers? I was just going to add in our grading and reporting procedures, um, students do not fail a course um, due to a given number of absences. Okay. So that's it's not really connected then. Right. Ms. Rowe, the uh, grades are really connected to performance on the standards. Correct. Typically, yeah. however, we know, of course, if students are not attending, they're not engaging in, in working through learning their skills and their contents of the standards. And so typically they are not able to demonstrate that they know and can do the requirements of the standards because they have missed the actual teaching, learning, and practice process. Okay. So um, in regard to academic achievement, do we have or can we obtain data on students who go from BCPS to community college or four-year colleges and require remedial math and language courses before they can proceed with their college coursework? 
I will need to defer that to Dr. Wheatley Phillips. I think I just saw her glow for a moment. <laughs> glow for a <laughs> bit. <you>. So <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. McComas. And, and Ms. Rowe, our research team has really been putting together a study to take a look at college and career readiness, to look at those students that actually um, not only attend BCPS, but participate in different assessments and then matriculate to um, at the, the college level, at the CC, at the community college level, in terms of how the students are performing. We have a great relationship with them. And one of our system improvement team has been looking at some of the data that we've collected for students that are performing um, at the college level. So we certainly can circle back. Um, I will have to check our key reports page um, for our website because there might be a, a research report that we had developed regarding that, but we certainly can look into that um, and provide additional information because we have had conversations, we have looked at the data, I just have to see how we package that information. Well, let me just, just also remind the board, we looked at several data points and that got us to our compass and looking at those targets at every level elementary, middle, and high, where we were pushing more students to reach those targets. So when they finish, uh, when they finish BCPS, they are not uh, now moving on into additional remedial courses at the college level. And as Dr. Wheatley Phillips talked about, that's the work and the data analysis that we want, we are continuing to explore, which gets right back to our system improvement team, looking at um, SAT, ACT, and the ACUPLACER. The ACUPLACER is the assessment um, that students would take if going to um, any of our two-year or community college and, and working, as Dr. Wheatley Phillips said, a good relationship with CCBC and really having more conversations regarding what does that look like for our students who are finishing our program and enrolling in CCBC and, and answering those questions. Why are they now taking, <clears throat> pardon me, remedial courses as they're entering in their first year out of either high school? So that's the work. That's the work that we started. That's the work that we will continue to explore because we really want to unpack why is, why is that happening. So are we also collecting data? The majority of our students don't go to college after they graduate high school. And some of them are leaving BCPS with different certifications. Are we exploring outcomes for those students to see if they're finding employment with those certifications? And are we looking at I guess what I'm interested in, what the real effectiveness of our education system is what happens to the student once they get, graduate. Are they able to get a job? What kind of a job are they able to get? Are they able to get into college if they want to? Are we studying the outcomes aside from just college students? Absolutely, uh, Ms. Rowe. A, a part of the work and working with Doug Handy and the team is looking at our CTE programs. That's what I reference about the completers. When, when our students are finishing the, all of the course and the hours related to that program, and then are they getting their license after they have completed and they have to sit for that assessment? The other piece is a little tricky data trying to find um, the data when students leave us and how are they doing their first year in college or second year in college. I know I've been working with uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillips on that. How do we have access to see how our students are doing? So we, we, we are looking at college and career ready, not only in terms of getting into a, a two or four year program, but what about our students who are finishing and, and they're working and how do we gather our data? That's that work that we started and we will continue to explore that because I think your point is well taken. You know, We have a, a variety of creative students out there and they've been working and they want to continue the work or they want to go into the military, how do we capture that once they finish BCPS and we can kind of follow them for a year or two just to see how the success rates, because I do have that, that interest to really look at all of our students and how they're doing and also working with our local colleges to really look at and support how can we support them in their graduation rates that once kids finish, that either they're working, they're in, in the military, or they're starting these two or four year programs and they're actually completing those two and four year programs. So that's, that's the, the work around the CTE 
and what we're doing about AVID and what we're doing about the completers and the licensure and all of that. How do we increase our numbers? We have good numbers. We've been analyzing the data, disaggregating the data, but working with our school staff and our central office about what else can we do to, to get better results. So I appreciate that. We're, we're not just looking at college. We're looking at college. Should you be sharing that data with us? When we have point? it. Oh, absolutely. That's what I reference. Okay. That's what I reference about looking at times in which we can bring back data, available data, and say, here's the results. Here's what we're working on. This is where we hit the mark, and here's some areas that we need to improve on. So, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you okay, for that. Thanks. And um, now it looks like the next was Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I'm going to warn everybody I'm going to be as brief as I can, uh, but I'm going to be jumping around on topics. Uh, the first question I have, we haven't heard anything about tonight so far, is um, I'm looking for an update on graduation plans, and specifically has Towson University given us an answer about our use of the, the CQ Center for our graduation ceremonies? So, Mr. Kuhn, we are working with the Towson Center as we speak, and once we are able to finalize those plans, we'll be happy to share uh, with the board, and then we'll share with the community. I know there were some questions about the class of 2021. Um, we had a brief update today. There's some logistical things we have to continue to work through, um, but um, we'll be happy to provide it. We're working, Dr. Zarchin, Kim Ferguson, Dr. Amalio, Nueves, they have been working diligently on trying to get some answers as we speak. Um, and so we'll be happy to provide an update on that. So if the CQ Center is not available, are we going to see if their stadium is available for our use uh, as a large outdoor venue? We will look at several alternatives um, <clears throat> but again you know the team came today and provided some updates and we just got a few logistics that we have to work through um, so um, we'll have something as soon as possible and we want to look at some alternatives just in case uh, that doesn't work but um, we'll be we'll be providing some updates Thank you. Can somebody let me know how many students have IEPs and 504s? Mr. Kuhn, I, I don't have that number right off uh, the, the cuff tonight. Um, I will see what I can find out uh, for that number. Um, I, I think it runs uh, approximately... I, he I hesitate to even say it because I, I will surely get the number wrong, Mr. Kuhn. I will see what I can find out in the next couple of minutes here for us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, I, I, it's approximately oh, 15,700. I'm so sorry, Mr. Kuhn, to cut you off. That's fine. I Thank appreciate you. that. Mm -hmm. You're muted. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you. Uh, based on the presentation earlier, I'm on slide 18. It sounds as if we are going to have very limited data um, about um, 2021, <laughs> in 2021. The only thing that I'm seeing here are the BCPS curriculum-based assessments and diagnostic tasks as ways to track what's actually going on. Do we have that data and is it being shared and propagated throughout the enterprise so everybody understands where these children are? So, I'm sorry, Dr. Williams, I didn't want to. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me just say this. What, in addition to what we presented, we also have the national data. So I don't want to forget of, uh, regarding how our students have done on the PSAT, SAT, and the AP, and potentially IB as well. Uh, Dr. McComas, you want to add to that? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, so what I would share, uh, Mr. Kuhn, and for everyone, is that our diagnostic tests are really at the beginning of each unit. And if, if they really are performance uh, opportunities for our students to demonstrate prerequisite um, skills and knowledge uh, that typically they may have had going into a unit. And what that information does, it's really you're looking at student work samples, is it helps our teachers identify what are those critical skills or content areas that the students had that may have been interrupted uh, from last year's pandemic um, or that are gaps. Um, and so what that does is the teacher has to continue to make progress on the current standards while they're addressing those gaps in real time. Um, so I think the short of your answer is, where we really see that is at the end of the unit in the curriculum-based assessments is where we really are um, seeing to what extent have we been working on the standards and the content knowledge and the student acquisition of that. And that's our real-time um, working, uh, leading data, if you will, to help us. Thank you. With with just that leading data <laughs> available, are we able to identify where our children are overall? Like what 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 the deficit is from all this time remotely and or um, well, I mean, if we're not if they're not coming to school, we don't know what's happening. Um, but do are we able to sit there and say, you know, thirty percent of children are now at a twenty percent deficit? I would say that we have to look at unit by unit by the standards. So it's not as simple as saying, you know, I don't, I can't just pull and say across the system, a certain percentage of students on a particular standard uh, where they perform. We have to go and look at, at those assessments um, and then consolidate that because they rest in the unit assessments. Thanks. I'll, I'll reserve the rest of my 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. I hope I helped a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Looks like um, we have a follow-up question from Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that all students have the opportunity to return to school in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26 or sooner. Second, Hen. Could you please put your motion in the chat? Okay. So I will... Restate Ms. Causey's motion. Ms. Causey moves that all students have the opportunity to return to school in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26th or sooner. And that was seconded by Ms. Hen. Ms. Causey, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott, Madam Chair. Um, and I'll be brief. Um, the, we've had a lot of good discussion. There's been a lot of uh, good information shared. And um, what, in looking at the data presented by the Maryland State Department of Education related to second term attendance, uh, the rates by race, ethnicity, the uh, increase in the failure rates, um, and the decreasing attendance, and the fact that uh, Baltimore County uh, is uh, so low, and um, also with the understanding that time is running out for this school year. And we know that uh, the mitigation strategies are in place. We heard from our three community superintendents. Um, uh, I've been to schools, and thank you for that opportunity, Dr. Williams, to see this all working. And our staff are brilliant and hardworking. Our teachers, uh, if they're set up, they're good to go. They don't need another three weeks to, you know, uh, you know, they they work on the fly. Um, I've heard from a number, and, and, and I know others have as well, that everyone is so grateful to be together in the buildings. Um, and our children just need to uh, really get a return to normalcy. And when we've had losses in the communities, the children come to school and receive support. So we know that there's loss. We know that there's struggles with the pandemic. But they're not going to do better uh, by having these uh, negative outcomes that we're seeing and that we're hearing from um, from a wide range of our um, stakeholders and the data. The data is right there. Um, so I, I just would uh, encourage my board members to, to take this um, step uh, to support the work that has been done to make this mitigation work, to make the transportation we heard was doing a great job. 
to support all of that good work with the increase the students need. Thank you, Ms. Calzy. And if I could um, speak to that, and then I'll go through the questions because I've not yet spoken. Um, I believe that that could be a um, rather knee-jerk and somewhat dangerous. Um, Dr. Williams, I am of the impression that you all are working um, following CDC guidelines and are bringing our students back. We have heard from the public about, you know, wanting to return. And we've heard from our stakeholders from various groups and organizations who have spoken about the hybrid approach and um, wanting students to uh, uh, having the option for their students to remain virtual. My question with this motion is that those that still want to remain virtual and choose not to return back, would this take that away from them? Because in, um, yes, as we know, there are certain areas where the numbers of COVID are lower. However, there are certain parts, because we have a large um, county, certain parts, especially in the area that I'm from, where the numbers are higher. Um, there are areas where it's more rural and, and there are lower incidents, but students who live in areas where they've experienced more loss, where they've experienced more sickness, and where these sending them back could have more detrimental impacts for students in these areas, I feel is dangerous. And I feel I would like to hear from you, Dr. Williams, as far as what were some of the suggestions from like um, Hopkins and, and the University of Maryland? What did they think of the approach, the systemic approach that the system is taking to having our students go back? What were their suggestions and what did they feel about how we're approaching it so far? Well, um, let me just respond. We have been working with our COVID 19 task force. We've been working with the Department of Health, uh, and we also been working with our um, health advisory. And so, I want to go back in depth. Somerville, and Mike Zarchin can respond quickly. But the the CDC guidelines is really referencing the three feet, and in, in, in that document, it talks about the younger students. Um, every time we have conversations, so I'm. I will caution the board around that motion where it says all students, as, as we reported earlier in the design team talked about the younger students, as well as students, some of our vulnerable learners. Um, keep in mind that the CDC is, is referencing the younger students and the three feet at the younger ages versus the older students. Uh, transportation, of course, and the logistics, but also we have to work with our staff and families. And so to, to make that motion and to say all students, I think that is something that I would ask the board to rethink based on how we have approached this with our phased in, based on the guidance from um, the documents that we're reading from the CDC um, and what we reported at the last meeting, what Dr. Zarchin and Deb Somerville shared about the high transmission rate. And so I think, like the design team said, we have been uh, looking at how do we expand um, additional opportunities for students? But I would really caution the board to look at all students and to what, what worked well was a phase in. And I have to say this, please, we are completely different from Hartford County and Carroll County, just by numbers and demographics and based on how we've been impacted by, pand by the pandemic. And so the size does matter. Um, Again, we recognize we have a lot of work to do, um, but the fate, we have been uh, getting recommendations and guidance by the health experts. We've been sharing our plans. We've been getting their feedback, um, and the phase-in model has worked. Um, and with what's going on in our county, as Dr. Zarch and Deb Somerville shared, I'm just a little concerned. I'm a lot of concern with just looking at all students with a time frame. Allow us to work through, as I shared earlier, the guidance. The next two weeks are very critical about what's happening based on spring break, allowing those two weeks to transpire, as well as allowing the design team to work with our school leaders, our unions, to move forward to get more students back is a goal. And the goal as well, as things are looking well, 
in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the vaccines. You know, it is our hope that if that's moving well, that the fall will look completely different, um, that we will be looking at some sense of normalcy uh, as well as uh, other options and alternatives. But I would just caution the board with, uh, regarding that motion. Okay. Time. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And I would um, also, I, I think that we should be pragmatic and, and cautious. And um, again, we are, you know, I, I, the system is, is working. They're being pragmatic. And I think that motions like this um, are dangerous because it just says all students just four days a week. So I'm going to go in the order of uh, there's some questions here, though, and I want to go in the order that they asked on my motion. You, you already spoke to your motion and there are questions now um, for your motion. So we'll go in the order. The next is from uh, questions from Dr. Hager. Dr. Hager, are you there? Um, Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I was actually going to say something very similar to Dr. Williams, that the CDC guidance is really just for elementary schools at the three feet, um, at which uh, Dr. Williams just said. Um, so I, I would have trouble supporting a motion that includes middle and high schoolers just because of the current guidance, and it could change. But as of now, um, it really does just focus on elementary schools. And I just would like to say that I am very hopeful that we can figure this out for elementary schoolers, assuming the positivity rate does not leap up um, from spring break, but assuming things stay okay, then I'm hopeful that we won't um, get in our own way of being able to do this for the elementary schoolers on our own. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Next is Mr. Offerman. Uh, I have concerns over this motion for the exact same reasons that uh, Dr. Hager stated. And uh, I don't know how we can, uh, in the middle of this worldwide pandemic, make statements or, or motions like this without without the consideration of the uh, of the health experts and the health risk. What when, when the health experts that the you know, from uh, Baltimore County, state of Maryland and the C D C say it's safe, I would love everybody back. I love I love I like everybody back yesterday. But 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 in my mind it has to be safe. And and I mean safe for, for everyone. Not just the students, the students' families OK, because we don't know, you know, there's still no there's still no definitive information of whether someone can actually carry this back. OK, they're uh, to the family. So I'm, I'm interested in what's best for all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Excuse me. Next is Miss Jose. Thank you, Miss Scott. Um, Dr. Williams answered a lot of my questions. My question again is, um, you know, making superlative statements like our teachers can work on the fly and they're wishing to go back. It's not true for all thousands of teachers. Um, our metrics are going up and I, I'm concerned about us stepping into operations, just like we don't tell Dr. Williams when to close schools for snow days. Um, this is his expertise and he's got a group of staff that works with and I'm going to look for his recommendations on reopening schools. We all want schools to reopen. Uh, definitely me as a working mom, I want schools open. But uh, I'm going to listen to the experts, and I'm going to have a lot of difficulty supporting this motion at this juncture. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Next is Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe? Hi, yes. Um, I would just want to say that I really think that we should follow the data and let healthcare infectious disease professionals do their job. No one on this board is more qualified than the CDC to issue guidance related to infectious disease in any setting, and we can't allow public pressure to push us to make unreasonable decisions. And additionally, we have new variants hitting us in the spring and in the coming weeks, and no one has a crystal ball. We don't really know what's gonna happen. So to set some kind of a hard date to have students attending four days when, you know, we could set that hard date and then the, the disease could take a different route and we could end up having to change it when CDC issues new guidance that says close all the schools again. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. So I, I don't think that we need to be issuing mandates at this point. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Next is Mr. Mahomza. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Uh, my, yeah, my comments are similar to other board members. I just, um, I'm apprehensive about um, just after we uh, took this time to uh, carefully reopen for hybrid, 
um, and phasing in um, each grade slow, not that slow, but um, in a more controlled manner than just um, bring everybody back in the next two weeks. I, I, I just don't, I don't see how um, that's pragmatic at all. Um, and also with that, I would just, uh, I know that they mentioned other school systems have been doing similar things, but um, I haven't heard health experts, uh, county, local, uh, county, state, or federal, um, okaying the four days for all. I know that they did mention the three feet for younger children. So I haven't seen um, the data on um, the old, every student coming back. So I, that's my concern. I, I, I really would like um, staff and um, um, the, the county officials to work together to develop a plan and give us recommendations and not us making the decision without um, knowing fully well what we're uh, voting on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahumza. Next is Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. I would like to make a few comments about this. And I want to start by saying we're literally talking about reopening schools four days a week in May. And April 26th is one week before May May starts. So I, I, I'm not quite sure why everybody is is you know having an issue with going one week earlier. The other thing I want to point out is there are multiple schools that are open. I live in Towson and there's a private Catholic elementary school that has been open the entire year, five days a week. Every child that wants to be in school is there. So it can be done. You have to have the will to do it. They may have had to send people home and quarantine some here and there, but we have to try. And I think that it is the best thing for the children. Um, at this point in time, I would have prefer to take the approach to send kids that have 504s and IEPs back um, on the 12th. That would have been my preference to try and push us to do something for them now to move things forward and perhaps wait and see how that went before moving to move everybody back uh, to four days and or five days. Um, but this is the motion we have right now, so I plan on supporting it. Uh, yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to make an amendment to that all elementary school students and students with IEPs or 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26 or sooner. Um, Excuse me, Ms. Kelsey, you have two um, motions in there. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just a little confused. So there's the first motion, then you put something up here above. It's another motion. Madam Chair, may I comment? Um, this is Ms. Uh, Han. Hold on a minute, though. Hold on, Ms. Ms. Han. I, I'm trying to understand um, Ms. Kelsey's okay. amendment. You're amending the first motion that you made? Yes, ma'am. Based on discussion from board members and comments and looking at the data. Okay. I put the amendment in the chat, Madam Chair. That's why I was trying to clarify. Okay. Thank you. Now I see. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Hen, for, do, for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Um, so you put it in the chat, but the amendment is being made by Ms. Causey. So Ms. Causey, are you striking language from your original motion or you're amending your motion? Yes, and I'm gonna um, put it in the chat. Okay. Okay, there it is. Um, now I'm really confused because the amendment that you have above that Ms. Hen had put in there that you stated below, it looks different or is it exactly the same language? It's exactly the same. Okay, so basically you struck out the language from your first motion and then 
now this is the um, amended version of the motion. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does this require a second? Second, Hen. Okay. Thank you. So I will restate it. Ms. Causey moved that all elementary school students and students with IEPs or 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26th or sooner. And that was seconded by Ms. Hen. Okay, so that is the motion as amended. So to speak to that, um, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, please. Um, when staff was discussing the timelines, they were going to, uh, it sounded very um, loose, come to the meeting on April 20th and discuss the plans. Um, they've done a lot of work and the schoolhouses have done a lot of work and they have all of the logistics in place. They have the same uh, link on the high school, I mean, on the school websites. Um, you know, they've, they've done it successfully thus far with the four phases. Um, our children need this. This is what we are about, is helping our children and um, supporting the families in, in, in doing that. And I, of course, recognize that we will be following all the CDC, state and local health uh, guidelines and regulations. That's, we, that's what we have to do. But there are uh, other districts right around us, Baltimore City, Howard County, uh, that are returning to instruction. So um, I understand we're in a pandemic. Uh, so are, is everyone else in the state of Maryland. And again, the parents will have the opportunity to decide if there are circumstances for them that uh, make in-person not the best choice. They have that opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, and I want to make sure we process all the questions in regards to this motion. Um, next, we have Ms. Pastor. You're um, on mute. Just skip me, Ms. Um, Ms. Scott. Skip you. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Ms. Hen. I'm good, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, Mr. McMillian. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw your name in there. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Um, Ms. Scott, if I may yes. comment on that. Yes, Dr. I, Williams. I, I want to go back and just re make a comment. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the design team and our unions and our stakeholders. Um, the work has been... Um, has been challenging and we have been dealing with all different types of obstacles and challenges that have been non-pandemic. Non um, I don't want the team to feel that we've, we've come and presented anything that's loose, but I also would just say that the design team did offer to come at the next board meeting and provide an update following the CDC guidelines, looking at our younger students with the potential of expanding that. And I would just ask the board, allow us to do the work, allow us to work with our partners, allow us to work with our health officials to come up with a dual, a workable plan. And again, I, I wanna caution that our staff, as Dr. Roberts, Dr. Jones, and Ms. Byers shared, the work has been working through the hybrid model with students in front of them as well as students online. And we wanna make sure we are providing the ample enough time for our staff to adjust, our families definitely, but also the logistics. And so I wanna go back to what was shared earlier um, when we provided the presentation and we provided some clarity. Allow the design team to come forth and present. This is what we're thinking about moving forward. And, and really looking at our younger students. And so that would encompass, as it was reported, our younger students and our most vulnerable students. And there was a question about the numbers of students that are receiving uh, students with an IEP or 504. Allow us to work through the logistics and present a plan back to the board um, before we move forward with um, 
this motion and specific data and next points that we have to look at the logistics with all of this. As much as, as I want to take something that Mr. Offerman said, as much as I would want students back in schools every day, the guidance, we're following the guidance, and again, each community has been impacted differently. And, and I just want to make sure we are really thinking through some of these expectations um, at 1040 at night on Tuesday. Um, I just want to make sure the board is understanding what this means. And the design team has been working real hard, Ms. Causey, and our school leaders have been working real hard, and our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our building services, our bus drivers. And so allow us to work through a plan and present it back to the board as we have done all year. Uh, I'm just a little cautious about these timelines, not knowing what the next two weeks will bring, as the health officials are saying, is the, the worry is that it's spiking coming from spring break. So I just want to caution the board once again with this motion um, that's, that's been shared today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looked like there was a question from Mr. Offerman. Are we, ju are we just at this point discussing the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, excuse me, are we discussing the amendment? We're discussing the motion as amended. Yes. No, the motion as amended. Okay. Yeah, the amendment. But yes. I, because I didn't realize the I amendment didn't realize that we have voted on the uh, on the amendment. We've not voted on the amendment. Okay. Okay. So, can someone just clearly state what what the what the entire motion is now at this moment? At this moment, because Ms. Causey struck out the previous language and she moved that all elementary school students and students with IEPs or 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26th or sooner. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for that. Secondly, again, I'm going to follow what, what, what Dr. Williams has said. Okay. And, and, and uh, I understand there are there are certainly other opinions, but uh, I don't think Ms. Causey or anybody else knows if everyone is ready, as she said, just ready to go back and and uh, and uh, everything is already in place. That that's not what I'm hearing from uh, from uh, from Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, Ms. Pastore, you you have a question or comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Williams for very clearly stating that piece. We want to see them back, but we want to do it well. We spent a lot of time talking about academic achievement and taking care of our young folks. I know that the end of April is one week from May, but a week in terms of planning and safeguarding and, and putting all of the pieces, buses, all of that in play. We've had one day of everybody being back. I don't see that as quite enough to assess these things. And our children, if they have um, special needs and our younger ones, they deserve the planning and the thinking through. And I also want to thank the design team for the work that they're doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Um, are we ready to vote on this? Oh, we still have more comments. Okay, Ms. Calls, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you. I appreciate um, the work of everyone in the school system. It, 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 it truly has been, we've, we've faced as Baltimore County Public Schools a double crisis with the ransom attack. That's absolutely true. But our children should not have to have less because we are struggling uh, to recover, but we are recovering. Uh, the other thing is that I would say is if things um, do worsen, then we will have a board meeting and the superintendent can come to us and tell us the CDC has said this, the local has said that, health advisory has said that, and so we can't move forward. Um, so there is time, and that date that I put in was deliberate, to be able to have that board meeting time um, to come back if it's not going to work, if the variants are coming and the health metrics go up and the CDC gives us additional guidance. 
Um, but you know, we've been planning and planning, and it, it, it's time. So I, okay. I think this. Thank you. It looks like you. we have a comment from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I just want to address a few items. Um, we've been planning and um, preparing for students to return for six to eight months now. Um, and I'm not quite sure. I, I think what I'm sensing is you know, there's a lot of question marks with what's happening with um, with the virus and the spread in our community. Um, one of the things that I keep coming back to is my understanding that schools aren't super spreaders. They they have um, uh, spread rates that are much lower than the community uh, that they're that they're in. And um, I think the positives outweigh the negatives in this. So I'm going to support it. I do understand uh, people's hesitancy. Um, but like I said before, there are other schools even in our counties that are that are operating and they're open and schools across the country that are operating and opening, not just in rural areas, but uh, the entire state of Florida and Texas. So there are significant school systems that are open and operating and we're not forcing everyone to go back. This is still, you know, a, a limited population for of people to make the decisions whether or not they want their children to go back for four days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, my only question would be, as I read the motion, I mean, the amendment, it still says all elementary school students. So it, it would still take away the option for um, those who wanted to remain virtual. And even Madam still with Chair, it, it, my, it does not. I, excuse me. It, I was still speaking. Um, so that is a concern to me, one. And then number two, um, my my issue with that is anything that just says all, um, as Ms. Causey had said before, not all of our children, um, are, all our children shouldn't have less. Well, not all of our children have less. Some children are, are doing well and um, are, are, are thriving, as we've heard from stakeholders. So I think speaking in absolutes, anytime I see all and all children and our, we, we just can't speak like that. And I find that this motion is, is short sighted. So um, now I'm done speaking. And so it sounded like there were some people who would like to speak or say something. So I'm looking in the chat now. And um, was that you, Mr. Kuhn, who has a comment? I do have a comment. I just, I, I was looking at it and it says they have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction. Nowhere does it say all children have to go back. It says all elementary school students and students with IEPs and 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction. Mm -hmm. So unless that's not clear enough language, and we need to modify it because you're you're saying that you believe all students are going to be forced back. And I don't I don't believe that. So I just need clarification from someone because <laughs> my my interpretation seems to be very different um, than, okay. than what you had said. So and that is why. Clarification. Cor correct. Um, I don't have clarification on it. And that's how the, the because the motion is, is the way it's written. Um, and stated it, it it's wide reaching and ranging and it's not definitive which is uh, again I, I'm not sure that we should be making such um, substantive motions um, 10 o'clock at night that is also another concern but okay let me make sure um, it looks like there's some additional questions um, Miss Hen did you have a comment or question Yes, thank you. I, I was going to make the comment that Mr. Kuhn made that the motion as amended is crystal clear, that it's the opportunity to return. It doesn't restrict it to all students. It doesn't take away the opportunity to stay virtual. It gives all students the option, the opportunity, if they elect to return to in-person instruction. So I don't think any 
other wording could be more clear that it's the opportunity to return. It's not forced to return. So I wanted to provide that clarification. I'm supporting it for that reason as it is an option and not a mandate. So thank you. Thank you. Next was Josh Mahomza. Yes. Uh, I had a quick question um, for the um, parliamentarian. Uh, is is it appropriate to amend um, an amendment? And I apologize, Madam Chair. That's fine. Mr. Mercedes? Yes. Hello, Mr. Mahamza. Yes, there can be two amendments to a motion. But as I understand it, there is currently just one amendment to the main motion at this time. So you can amend amendment, right? Correct. Okay. Um, okay. I had um, the following motion. Um, I move to strike out the language, all elementary school students, uh, and replace it with grades pre-K to second grade, and also replace the language starting April 26 or so or sooner or so sooner for the language starting on a date recommended by staff. Mr. Mahomes, could you put that in the chat, please? Yes, give me a second. Okay, and then Mr. Mercedes, I just wanted to be clear. Um, so this is the last amendment to the motion that can be made. So then next we will process Mr. Mahomes' amendment, and then after that process Ms. Calsey's amendment. Is that the correct that order? That's correct, Ms. Scott. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, could Mr. Mahomes put his amendment? In yep, that that's what I just asked. <laughs> Thank you. And I have a question when it's my turn. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. So, um, Mr. Mohamza moved um, that grades pre-K through second grade and... Sorry, it moved. I, I'm sorry. Mr. Mahomes moved that grades pre-K through second grade and students with IEPs or 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction four days a week starting on a date recommended by staff. Um, was there a second to that? Second, Molly. Second. Thank you. That was seconded by Ms. Joes. Okay, so, yeah. and um, Mr. Mahomes, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah. Yeah. The reason why I th I thought it was appropriate to do um, pre-K through second grade uh, and also keeping um, the students with IEPs and 414s is it's similar to um, the phase reopening plan, and those groups were um, uh, in the first cohort of students um, to return to hybrid learning. And the reason why I didn't want us to have a determined date and allow staff to um, plan is because we've made motions um, for set dates. And obviously, some like and the motions I'm talking about was concerning athletics, and that didn't pass. And when staff was given the opportunity to evaluate with the team, they actually bought a plan that um, was a date earlier than originally proposed by the board. So at times, we might think we're doing the right thing and proposing a date, but um, staff might work together, come up with plans, consult with health professionals, and actually come up with better plans than we might think that we might have. And that's why I think it's important to, although pro give them ideas, but also um, give them um, the leeway um, um, to do their job. I don't want us to be in operations a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahumza. And I'm going in order um, of how I see it. So um, I, next I had Ms. Hen. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Mahumza, for offering this amendment. My concern is that if we don't specify a date or put parameters on this, 
then it leaves it open-ended. And we could be looking at fall. We could be looking at 2024. There are no parameters here. So I wouldn't support it for that reason. I think it's too open-ended. But I thank you for offering it and trying to reach a compromise with the group. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. Um, yeah, a question and a comment. I, I am not quite sure about the second grade cutoff. I know you said it was because the that was the first cohort to go back, but there's nothing in the guidance that in the CDC guidance that would suggest just st stopping at second grade. Um, but my bigger issue is um, similar to Ms. Hen, the vagueness of it. And frankly, I'm I'm willing to wait until April 20th to hear the school system's plan um, in hoping that they will follow through with the May um, four days a week elementary school plan that we had heard about, assuming all the metrics are in place. So um, so you can respond if you want, uh, Mr. Mahamza, or, um, or not. But I, again, I personally am in the camp of waiting until April 20th to yes. hear more. Yeah, and the reason why um, I thought it was appropriate to stick to a plan that was similar to the phase reopening is because I know the, uh, that it took uh, um, principals and staff members uh, a, a lot of work to plan um, for students coming back, whether it's um, setting up transportation, um, uh, the screening of students and paperwork, et cetera. Um, so I didn't want us to include a, uh, all elementary schoolers because I, everybody knows that elementary, the elementary school population is the largest population uh, concerning grade levels. Um, and so I don't want a huge group of students coming in um, when we can easily um, follow the previous plan that we had and that has worked perfectly. And in terms of um, a vague date, the reason why I said to be determined by staff, uh, we, can e staff we can easily make this motion again next board meeting okay. on the 20th if staff doesn't have a plan. It's not like we're not going to have another meeting until August. Um, All right. <laughs> we can easily make this motion any time. That was your time, Mr. Mahumza. By then. Thank you. <laughs> next is Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just did want to um, thank Mr. Mahumza for uh, offering this. Uh, in terms of trying to build um, consensus, um, but I I, I, I I don't agree with that. Um, the board did vote to approve starting the athletics on a certain date, and boards throughout Maryland have been making these uh, decisions. Um, and so I would just say again that um, also something else that I uh, stated earlier is if things have go well and the superintendent wants to add additional students to at any time, he's certainly welcome to do that. I don't want to be, uh, for anyone to feel that we're, uh, by making this motion for a smaller number of students to come back, rather than all students in all grades, um, that we're limiting any students, um, because if the superintendent and staff feel that additional students can come back because uh, the vaccines are rolling out faster and the numbers are getting better, then certainly by all means, uh, you know, uh, get the communications out. Uh, to, to everyone, so um, I won't be uh, I won't be supporting uh, this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thanks, Ms. Scott. Uh, regarding the amendment, um, unfortunately, uh, this just seems like the same plan we were already in the same path we're already on. Uh, so. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to support that. I understand um, um, the justification, uh, but again, um, I don't believe we're going to see any action unless we set uh, dates and parameters, and I believe that this is a workable one without, um, without the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Ms. Mack? Yes, I have a question for Dr. Williams and his staff. If on the 20th, in the next two weeks, the metrics improve dramatically, there is a lot of stability, the variants are subdued, um, and a motion is made on the 20th, at, at what point can we send all kids back to school four days? How much lead time does your team need? Design team, would you give um, an estimate time? 
So I, I just, there's two things in your question, Ms. Mack. Um, starting with all the all kits. So as we've stated, um, the CDC guidelines for three feet distinguishes between elementary and secondary. And really there's two factors for secondary that are different than elementary. The first is the transmission rate, because elementary is three feet regardless of transmission. Secondary, there, there's, they do look at transmission rate. Um, the other factor for secondary with three feet has to do with whether or not teachers and students change classes. In all of our middle and high schools, our teachers and our students change classrooms. So at the secondary level, based on CDC, we have to be at six feet. So that's the all. Um, so when we're talking about elementary, um, we're looking at um, May, to, if, to your point, if metrics are great and we're not, you know, variants aren't all over the place and in consultation with our health experts, um, things look good from a safety standpoint, we would look to bring back students at elementary schools four days a week. Um, we do have to work out. There are operational changes at the elementary school when you are going from um, an A and a B cohort to combining, essentially when you go to four days a week, you're combining the A cohort with the B cohort. So you have an A, B, and you have C. Um, there are operational changes in the elementary school that need to take place, that schools would need time to plan um, and organize with students, for with their staff, rather. For example, um, three feet is the classroom recommendation. It is not and cannot be the cafeteria recommendation because what the CDC says is if you take your mask down, you have to remain six feet apart. Well, when our children eat, whether that be in the cafeteria or the classroom, they take their masks down. So though, when you're combining cohorts, those are operational things that schools need time to work out. Um, Raquel George, I see you've turned your cameras on. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Yeah. Jones, and Dr. Roberts, if I you just want to thank Ms. Mack. I want to thank Ms. Mack for asking that question. Um, when we when we talk about logistics and we just think of things from a logistical standpoint, we do need, and Dr. Scriven can speak to it because he's got his camera on too, transportation does need time to be able to route and plan routes for the students. And that could take up to a couple of weeks. But the public, the Public health experts shared with us that we started today, we brought back our last phase today, and that we should carefully monitor and assess over the next over the next two weeks to see if what we are doing in terms of mitigation is actually working, to make sure that all of the pieces of our plan are actually working. And so we would at least need two weeks at minimum, and then the add-on for transportation. But I also wanted to add what is of concern is as much as we want to, all of us want to provide all options, the virtual option and the in-person option for students. Um, if we say all students with IEPs and 504s, what we're doing is saying that secondary students with IEPs and 504s would fall into that category that Ms. Bias just talked about that would require a different level of concern from our health and safety components of the plan. So that's why we were trying to follow the CDC guidelines as they stand to focus on our elementary school students because even students with IEPs and 504 still have the right to be able to travel to classes and participate in all the activities of, of all of our students. So I just wanted to add that as well, but at minimum, in speaking with our health advisory group, we were told to monitor what is working well. Today was our first day to monitor two weeks to make sure that it goes well so that we do not regress, that we do not have to close a school or revert back, but we can continue to progress forward in a very safe, deliberate and planned way. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. I appreciate that. But I guess my question is this. Now, hearing this entire discussion tonight where board members stand, what would prevent us from using the next two weeks to do all of the things you talked about and prepare to return to school if, if it is safe to do so? 
it's not throwaway work because at some point kids are going to return to school for four days. So why can't we take the next two weeks, work out all the logistics? And I'm not, a, I know hope is not a strategy, but hope for the best yeah. and be prepared after the next meeting to send our kids back to school. If it, if, if, if number one, they want to return. And if number two, it is truly safe to do so. I mean, it's why all, we, we should use these two weeks is what I'm but saying. Matt, we're, we're doing that. We, Day in, day out, during spring break, weekends, day and night, we're constantly thinking about reopening and meeting about reopening and studying the research and staying ahead of it. We planned earlier today. We're planning tomorrow. We're planning throughout the week. There is continual planning. So you're right. We are planning. It's just very hard to think about kind of like all the moving parts. But you're right. The next two weeks, we don't just wait for board meetings to make presentations. We're constantly planning the work of the team, meeting with principals, finding out what's happening out there. So that's what we plan to do. We plan to plan is just when will that actual date take place in a, in a safe way. So if you are planning to plan, how likely is it that, again, if the metrics are good, our students are safe, we haven't had any spikes because of spring break. There's few variants. If we're planning to plan and we take the next two weeks to work out the details, how soon after the meeting could our students return to school? And so that's what I'm going to have Dr. Scriven answer that question, because that brings into play some of the logistical pieces. But again, you're asking some very good questions. And thank you for asking these questions, Dr. Scriven. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jones. So, uh, Ms. Mack, one thing, I, I actually two points that I, I really uh, feel um, compelled to make. Uh, one, we have to look at the ability to continue to mitigate uh, on buses. Uh, one thing that would not be able to happen uh, is that we would not be able to continue with the social distancing on buses. Um, so uh, that's a point uh, that has to be put into the space. And I don't know if that's something that has been taken into consideration or not. Um, secondly, minimally speaking, uh, transportation would need three weeks. I, I know that uh, I'm not still new, but relatively new. Uh, one thing that we would all, always heard about was transportation, transportation, transportation. We have not heard as much about transportation because they've been very strategic um, to make sure that they've been intentional around how they're uh, setting routes and making sure that it's being done uh, in a safe uh, and an orderly manner. We need that time um, to make sure that we continue uh, to phase students back in a safe and orderly manner. So. Minimally speaking, my entire transportation staff is saying that they need at least three weeks to make sure that we can bring students back or continue to bring students back in a safe manner as we've done thus far through this phase and process. So those are the two pieces that I simply wanted to interject um, to the board um, for further consideration. and. I saw that Dr. Zarchin was on. I wasn't sure if he had anything that he wanted to add as well. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. I, I just want to go back to our last meeting and, and share some comments from our, our partners with Johns Hopkins, Maryland, and one of the leading experts from the CDC, where we were really praised for a purposeful but cautious approach where we focus on learning. And, and quality improvement. So that quality improvement is, is not based on a metric that we see from the CDC. It's based on what we're seeing as far as spread in schools and what may cause that. Um, another piece and a comment that I want to underscore that, that really hit me is as we're moving forward, and, and there is a plan to move forward, to add students to the school day, focusing on the younger grades, it is important that we maintain a purposeful pace so we can build confidence and trust with our stakeholders. Moving this forward now, I, I worry about eroding trust, 
with folks who may not be on the side of, hey, I'm ready to get back, but folks who are very concerned. We've got staff members just this past week who our nurses have had to consult where they've lost a family member due to COVID. We're in different places. I think we need to be respectful of where we all are, maintain a pace for a return, but a pace that we can learn and grow from and see where we're being successful and where we need to change some things. Transportation is a part of that, but it's it's also how we go about our day. At, Ms. Somerville mentioned earlier that some of the elementary schools, the private elementary schools, are, are being asked to, to cautiously enter that three feet of social distancing. And we're also seeing numbers in, in private schools go up in the past few weeks. So I just, I felt like that was important to share and wanted to. No, I appreciate that, Dr. Zarchin. And I wanna be clear in my last 30 seconds that I don't support the motion, but I don't think we need to waste two more weeks. And I, I think we need to be making hard plans that if this, if this, then this, and maybe if we need three weeks for the bus, we should presume that two weeks from now, we are gonna meet the metrics and kids are gonna be safe and teachers are gonna be safe. So then perhaps we would only need one more week after that in which to make this happen. Thank you. And I, I wanna assure you that the next two weeks, it is not without planning. I can tell you in the next two weeks, we'll meet with the experts from Johns Hopkins and Maryland twice, once this week and once next week. In the next two weeks, we will have our health services monitoring the spread in schools, in athletics, after school. This is critical for us to bring students back safely and protect our staff and families. So I appreciate that. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going in Thank order. You. I see it here. Next, we have a question or comment from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Ms. Mack expressed really well my concerns. I think the reason the board is pushing towards a specific date isn't so much to um, pour staff into that date, but rather to ensure readiness. And that's my concern as well. When I hear that we need three weeks from the point at which we determine it's safe, I have the same question Ms. Mack does. Why aren't we ready to go when the CDC and our health experts say it's safe to go because our kids are missing out on that time. At what point are we ahead of the curve to say, okay, we're gonna turn this with, as Ms. Mack said, a week's notice to parents and stakeholders and communicate to them now, this is our intention. We're going to pre prepare as if we are returning on April 26th. And on the 20th, if that's changed and our plans need to change, then we can respond. But I think the frustration that, that you're hearing from board members is that there's going to be a continued lag behind our responsiveness. And it's not for lack of work. We know everyone's working hard, but I'm still not understanding why there's a need for such a delay and why we can't get ahead of this and be prepared to move when the metrics say it's safe to move. Again, not to rush the actual return itself, but to ensure um, that the system is ready to respond quickly, that we have transportation lined up. We know we're going to be moving this direction. So again, like Ms. Mack said, it's not lost work. We're doing the work anyway. Thank you, Ms. So Hen. I, there's a piece there that I, I feel like I need to touch on. It, we've, the science, the information has changed over the past year drastically. Just a couple months ago, with these numbers, we would not be in school. Because of what we've learned, not only from our experience, but nationally and internationally, we're not talking about shutting things down. We're talking about carefully bringing more students back. And we're in a very different place. The work, because of those changes, just look at the changes from the governor in the past th three months and the, the county, we are learning as we go. 
there has been hard work like I've never seen before from central office staff, school-based staff, families trying to prepare. The hard work will continue. The planning will continue. It's not about two weeks where we're not doing anything. We are learning so we can have a safe return. Um, thank you. So, Dr. Sargent, if I could just add to that, Ms. Hen, to your, to your comments. I, I'm thinking of the document Ms. Causey shared with us um, about an hour ago that, that she shared on the camera. That information, and I don't have the exact date, but I believe that information, that document, effectively that plan was shared with the board in late January, February. And that plan took us all the way through to the moment we sit now, the end of phase four and the full reopening of our school system to K-12. So in a sense, Ms. Hen, we did do that, and that's what we continue to do. We shared with you months in advance, not knowing what the metrics would be, certainly seeing trends and continuing to work with our health partners, but we did share with the community a plan months in advance that took us through April 6th. So all we're, I think, suggesting now is we just started today opening the door to all of our children. Dr. Zarchin very eloquently laid out the idea that we need the time based on what we're hearing from our Hopkins and UMMS professionals. We need these weeks to monitor, but we are still working so that when we come back to you on the 20th, as Ms. Spires mentioned earlier, we're presenting now the next phase that will take us through the next set of time. So I think the real work has happened as shared in that document that was shared earlier um, to the community and that w our plan is to do the same thing when the board meets um, in a couple of weeks to share kind of the next phase of that opening. So that real work is, continues to be done, as Dr. Zarchin mentioned. So I just wanted to offer that point. Ms. Byers, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. No, I was just I was just going to add, thank you, Ms. Hen. I, I think, just to echo that, the part of the planning is the evaluating. So it's one thing to set plans, like we're going to, you know, here's the transportation route here. But if we're not evaluating before we set that, what we wind up doing is our school-based plans look one way, and then we come back in a week and we said, well, we've evaluated this and we realized that this was a point of failure. And now all of a sudden, a school, you know, of I take some of my larger high schools, you know, or my larger elementary schools that have a thousand students, and they have to redo an entire plan. So it's it's not as simple as having the plan. It's evaluating what we're doing now so that when we do make those plans, we know confidently that we can um, proceed with them in a safe manner. That's all I was going to add. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so next it looks like... Um, Dr. Hager, you said to skip you. Okay, so the next is Ms. Jose. Ms. Scott, you can skip me. Ms. Um, Rowe can take the take my turn. Okay, next is Ms. Rowe. So um, I'd like to make a motion to call the vote. Before I do that, I'd like to ask Mr. Brusades if everyone's used their time, because there's no point in making that motion if people have all used their time anyway. Well, I do believe everyone has spoken to the motion, the amendment, and the amendment to amend the amendment. Everyone has spoken so are we ready? at are least are once. Are we ready to vote then, or does it require a motion? I feel that we're ready to vote if everyone else is ready to vote, because I think we've, we've debated it quite um, heavily. So um, if everyone's ready, then yes, we can, we can take the vote. Ms. Gover? <clears throat> just, just to be clear, Madam Chair, yes. we are voting. We are voting on Mr. Mahamza's oh. second amendment. Thank you for that. Yes, let me, um, and I'll read it because I know we have had quite a bit of debate. Okay, so the the what we're voting on. Thank you for that, Mr. Mercedes. Is Mr. Mahamza's amendment to Ms. Causey's motion? where he struck the language and he said, I vote, excuse me, I'm Mr. Mahomes moves that grades pre-K through second grade and students with IEPs or 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction four days a week, starting on a date recommended by staff. And that motion was seconded by Ms. Jose. So that's what we're voting on, is that um, is, is Mr. Mahomes' amendment. Uh, 
Okay. Right, call the vote. Okay. Um, Ms. Gover, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Staying. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is four. Okay, so Mr. Mahomes' amendment did not pass. And then now we go back up to Ms. Causey's amendment. I need to... Okay, and I'm going to restate it because I want to make sure. <laughs> um, Ms. Causey moved that all elementary school students and students with IEPs or 504 plans have the opportunity to return to in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26th or sooner. And that was seconded by Ms. Hen, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we're voting on that, oh, that amendment. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is four. Okay, so that amendment did not pass. And so now, um, do we need to process the, the original motion? I believe so. Getting this. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm going back up here. Okay, so Ms. Causey's original motion was Ms. Causey moved that all students have the opportunity to return to school in-person instruction four days a week starting April 26th or sooner. And that was seconded, I believe, by Ms. Hen. Correct. Okay. So now we will um, take a roll call vote on that. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is four. Okay, so that motion does not pass. Okay, and I want to make sure I get to everybody here. I'm scrolling back down. Oh, okay, Ms. Ms. Jose, you... You have a motion? Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. I move to postpone agenda items L, M, O, P, and Q to the April 20th meeting. Second. Second row. The motion was made and seconded. Ms. Um, Jose, if I, if you, could you please put that? Thank you. It is quite late. Okay, so Ms. Jose moved to postpone agenda items L, M, O, P, and Q to the April 20th meeting, and it was seconded, I believe, by, I heard two voices, Ms. Rowe and Ms. Hen, or Ms. Yes. I'm sorry, was that Ms. Rowe? Yes. Okay, Rowe. thank you. Sorry, it's a little late, so I'm trying to make sure um, I'm, I'm getting the right yeah. names. Um, I'm sorry, was that Ms. Ms. Hen? Yes, did you, were you the second, or I thought Ms. Rowe was? Um, oh, I, I, we both seconded it, but I'd like to offer an amendment to add item N. To add, I, I'm sorry, you want to make an amendment to add item N to N the... N as in Nancy, yes. N as in Nancy, let's see. Second, Causey. Thank you. 
And may I speak to my amendment? Oh, to add, I, okay, I'm sorry, um, just so I can understand that your motion, is, or excuse me, you're moving to add item in as a Nancy to the next board meeting. So could you put yeah. that in the chat, please? I just want to make sure that, um, that it's clear. Sure. And Thank I'd like you. to speak to my amendment, if I may, please. Yes, please. I think that would be very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. So there are 24 contracts under item N for consideration and in the interest of time and also um, the building and contracts committee was unable to complete its work going through all 24. I believe we got through 15. Um, so the remainder, remaining contracts um, are being heard by not only the committee, but the full board without a recommendation from the committee. Um, I would suggest moving item N to the next board meeting for consideration, considering it's almost 1130 at night. Thank you. Thank you. So the item, so the amendment was made by um, Ms. Hen, seconded by Ms. Causey, and Ms. Hen spoke to her amendment. Um, it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Causey. Actually, Ms. Scott, I had a comment before, prior to Ms. Causey. Oh, I'm sorry if I didn't see that. Um, Yes, Ms. Jones. Um, the, the specific reason I did not add item N was the building and contracts that have to be approved. There are some several time sensitive contracts in there, including roof replacements, and we could not process it because there were a lot of questions that committee members did not send in advance. Um, these are capital projects that need to be done in a timely manner because they have to be awarded, they have to um, go to the purchasing office. And if we don't implement it and we push it to April or May, they will not be implemented in time. Um, there's a couple of roof, roof replacements and AC for gyms that have to be done through. So after having spoken to staff, I think it's imperative that the board does the work of the board and, and does not hinder the progress of these contracts. So I will not be supporting moving item agenda N because we've discussed for three hours on reopening. So it's only after that we do the work of the board. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Jones. Next, Ms. Causey. I'll let Mr. Kuhn go first, and then I'll go after him, if that's okay, Madam Chair. I want to make sure I'm getting these in order. Um, was Mr. Kuhn next? Mr. Kuhn? Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, I would perhaps modify um, Ms. Jose's request. If there are specific items, I think she's talking about roof replacement. There's two of those and, and pavement and some AC unit re repair. I think there are a total of four contracts she's referring to. I think we could easily process that, process those uh, without too much uh, discussion, but I'm concerned that um, the other ones uh, need, need more focus. So if we could just do 21 through 24, I think that might meet um, Chair Jose's um, um, idea and, uh, and we'd be able to, to quickly process it. I just wanted it's to understand that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was just confused. Um, uh, Mr. Kuhn, you said that what you feel is that we could easily process 21 through 24 and then move the rest forward to the April 20th board meeting. Did I understand that correctly? That's that's what I believe. I'll let um, Ms. Jose um, you know, reply or or even have okay. uh, staff reply to see if, if the if time that's sensitivity of those um, are meet meet the need. Ms. Ms. Jose, could you if I may respond? Yes, thank you. Um, items 1 through 15 come recommended from the committee. We've gone through it. And items 16 through 24 would need to be approved by the full board. Um, I would like to approve, move forward 1 through 15 and critical contracts between 16 and 24. But to make that determination is going to be up to Mr. Dixit to um, pull some of those contracts that are critical for award and for implementation. So some of them are time sensitive that have to be done before fall hits, before it's, uh, they have to be done in the summer. So um, 
if Mr. Dixit is available, but I would like to process this motion first, if possible, and then work on the nuance of agenda item N after that. And Madam Chair, I would like to amend my amendment, if I may, to specify that agenda items N, 9 through 12, be postponed, which would allow us to process 1 through 8, um, 13 through 24. I think we can process through those quickly. 9 through 12 will require further discussion by the board. If those are not time sensitive, I would like to specify okay. that in my amendment. Because um, I want to make sure that we're processing ones that are time sensitive. Is Mr. Dixit available to, um, and I don't mean to um, skip over you, Ms. Causey. I just want to make sure we have understood. Is Mr. Dixit available? Um, is he still on the call? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma I'm still here. Okay. Um, could you just confirm, um, based on the motion of what, um, uh, and the amendment, so that we can process this properly, um, which of the contracts are time sensitive that need to be processed, like tonight, and which can wait till our next board meeting, the 20th? So let me thank uh, Mr. Kuhn and Ms. Joes for considering the uh, urgent nature of these contracts. The Five contracts that we would request board to approve tonight are is the 17, which is the modification to temporary lease, 21, 22, and uh, and two more at the right after that, 23 and 24. Okay, Ms. Causey, and thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dixit. Um, I was going to suggest that the um, <clears throat> that um, the chair of building and contracts uh, work with the board officers and Dr. Williams and staff to identify the timeliness and perhaps call one meeting that just deals with those contracts. Um, as was mentioned at the last meeting, and even earlier tonight, it's 11:30 at night, and we certainly don't want to make rush decisions because I wouldn't be prepared to vote. Um, and I tried to listen in to most of the building and contracts committee meeting, and I would not be prepared to to vote on, uh, you know, <clears throat> anywhere close to the number. Um, but if um, if um, Mr. Dixit were, um, and I believe this was consistent with Mr. Kuhn and uh, the uh, chair of building and contracts to do those five, did did Miss Hen make a specific motion? Miss um, uh, Joe's made um, the motion, and it was to postpone agenda items L, M, O, P, and Q to the April twentieth meeting. And then um, it, it was moved and seconded. And then Miss Hen um, amended the motion, and she added. She said, "I move to postpone agenda items L, M, N, O, P, and Q to the April twentieth meeting." Um, was there a second for Ms. Hen's amendment? No, there was not. So, could Madam Chair, I'd like to withdraw my amendment and move to postpone agenda items L, M, N, nine through twelve, O, P, and Q. I thought you, Ms. Calzy, was the second on Ms. Hen's amendment. Um, could you put that? Uh, so that's the second amendment to the motion. So if you could put that in the chat, so because there's a lot. It is of Madam movement Chair. going on. Yeah, just so we could. It's in the chat. Ms. Hen, Ms. Scott, if I may ask real quick, are you saying we would push through items N1 through 8 and 13 to 24 today? Yes, yes Ms. Joes. But only that those three contracts or, I guess, those four contracts you're moving to the next meeting? Correct. And could Mr. Saras clarify that N9 and 10, 11 and 12 are not time sensitive? Yes, this is Mr. Saras, and I don't see a problem with uh, moving... Uh, 9 through 12 to the April 20th board meeting. Okay. I will second Ms. Hens' motion then. Okay. You, Excuse yes, Ms. Causey. Um, Mr. Dixit had explained 
that for this evening, what was urgent and important was 17, 21, 22, 23, and 24. And I don't know why we would uh, continue to try and process uh, 21 contracts when Mr. Dixit had stated that he really only needed five tonight. It's 1134. We have a board member that's already said that uh, they're going to be unavailable after midnight. Um, I, I just don't think that that's appropriate. Those ones that we're speaking of processing, are those coming recommended from the committee? Yes, Ms. Scott, they are coming coming re recommended from the committee. N1 through N15 actually is, is recommended by the committee. So we would be processing N9 through 12, excuse me, we'd be processing we would, excuse me, be postponing N9 through 12 to the next board meeting. And so then Correct. we'd be processing. The remainder would be processed today. The remainder would be processed today. So that would be eight, one to eight, and then 13, 13 to, 24. to 24. And those were already processed during the building and contracts committee? No, 16 to 24 were not processed by the committee. It's going to be done by the board. And those should be easy. They're capital projects. Um, they already have um, RFPs issued. Mr. Dixit could run through those pretty quickly. They're all um, operation and maintenance cap capital projects. I agree. These all, the rest can be processed quickly, as Mr. O said. Okay, if that's the recommendation for coming from the committee, then I guess we could... Um, take a vote on the amendment and then on the motion. Oh, it looks like there's a question or comment from Ms. Causey from Dr. Hager. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Causey. Um, so to clarify, they are not recommended by the committee from contract 16 through 24. Not, they, not recommend, they were not addressed at all in the Buildings and Contracts Committee um, this afternoon. So to process, all of those um, properly, prudently, is going to take a um, considerable amount of time. So I, I will not be supporting that amendment, and then if the original amendment fails, we can start over again. Um, but that, that I, I don't agree with that, and um, I, <clears throat> I just don't think it's prudent. That's all I'll say. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next is um, question. Sure, I, I wanted to go in order. Though it looks like Dr. Hager had a had a question or comment, and then Ms. Hen. Thank you. you know, I just I, twenty one contracts feels like a lot for eleven thirty seven at night when when Mr. Dixit clearly said five were urgent. I I just don't understand. That's all. So, Ms. Scott, if I may respond. Well, uh, um, well first Ms. Hen, then you, Ms. Joe. Okay. I I defer to Ms. Joe's. Yes, Ms. Jos. Thank you, Ms. Hen. To clarify, too, um, a lot of the work is done on the in the committee. So when we're bringing recommendation, it comes recommended from the committee to answer your question. Dr. Hager, contracts N1 through N15 come recommended from the committee. So there's no extra processing you have to do when you've asked questions that have been answered. Uh, all board members get an opportunity to ask questions. Those contracts are put in uh, advance. As far as contracts N15 to 24 go, those are standard RFP contracts that were issued out to multiple vendors. And the lowest responsive vendor was chosen. It's been reviewed by um, committee members. It's just not been processed. We have to get approval from the board for it because we ran out of time since closed session was starting. So to answer your questions, no, they're not complex contracts. Those are standard um, RFPs that were issued out, and they are time sensitive. So in the interest of time, I'm going to ask the board to uh, move the previous question in and process Ms. Hen's amendment. Second. OK, so the question has been moved and seconded. Um, Ms. Gover, could we take a vote on moving the question, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Uh, is it, uh, yes. 
Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favors 11. Okay, so that was to move the question. Next is on the amendment um, to the motion, and I'll read the amendment again. Ms. Hen moved to postpone agenda items L, M, N, 9 through 12, O, P, and Q to the April 20th meeting, and it was seconded by Ms. Jose. So if we could take a roll call vote on that. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yeah. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hecker? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is eight. Okay. Mm. Okay, and then now um, the, we'll do the original motion as amended. Policy needs to go. She's nuts. So the original motion as amended, I move to, or excuse me, um, the original motion as amended is moving to postpone agenda items L, M, N, 9 through 12, O, P, and Q to the April 20th meeting. May we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Excuse me, Madam Chair, I don't think that's the correct motion as amendment amended I think the amendment is further down in the chat we've already done the amendment we already did the amendment the so now I'm doing the, and the, the amendment passed the amendment passed yeah so now I'm doing right. a motion as amended yes so I think you um, didn't repeat the amendment yeah I, I, I did repeat the amendment Mr. Mercedes could you weigh in? Because I thought I did repeat the amendment. I just read the motion as amended. Right. The, the amendment. The amendment passed. Dealt, yes. Yes. Passed. Not dealt with uh, 9 through 12. And now the main motion deals with LM9 and 9 through 12 OP and Q being postponed. Correct. Okay. So now I read the original motion. As, as presented from um, Ms. Um, Jose. Right, uh, yeah, right. With, with that amendment dealing with the certain contracts from item N. And 9 through 12. Okay, that's what I thought I just read. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, there was the other numbers that were, um, that scrolled by. Thank you. Okay. Um, I can read it again, but because I thought that's what I just read. So the motion was to move to postpone agenda items L, M, N, 9 through 12, O, P, and Q to the April 20th meeting. Ms. Gover. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Clausey? No. Ms. Mack? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay, so the motion. Yes. Favor is 10. Okay, so the motion carries. So the other items um, will be moved to the April 20th meeting. And then we are then going to process, make sure we have it right. (coughs) 
Okay, so now we're going to do the um, building contracts. So the next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, earlier this afternoon, the Building and Contracts Committee met and we reviewed um, approved contracts. So I'm going to move that the board approve contracts N1 through N8 and N13 through N15 as recommended by the Building and Contracts Committee. No second is needed as it comes recommended from the committee. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Do I... Do I have a motion to approve, or Ms. Jost just made a motion, and it doesn't um, require a second. Is there any discussion? Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Ms. Scott, could you repeat the, um, or Ms. Jost, could you repeat the contract numbers again? Yes, I'd be happy to. N1 through N8 and N13 through N15, as recommended by the committee. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Stain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Mr. Mahomsa? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Sorry, I abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Yes. Favor is eight. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Gover. So the motion carries. Okay. Ms. Scott? Yes, Ms. Jones. We still have to process contracts N16 through 24, and for that, I would like to call upon Mr. Dixit. Apologies for the late hour. Um, if he could go through those contracts so the board could approve them. Good evening, and thank you very much for considering these contracts. In the interest of time, I'll move fast. Uh, contract JB 70221, it's just a consent to assignment, meaning change of name of the company. The board has already approved the contract on December 22nd, 2020. The contract is with uh, the name change is from Canon Design to Canon Washington of one of the architectural companies. If there are no questions, I'll move to the next contract. I don't see any questions. So yes, you're, so you, Mr. Dixit, you're doing 16 through 24? That's right. Okay, yes, you can go to the next one. So the 17 is contract MWE-803-17A. And I'll provide a little bit of background to the board because some of you may not know about it. This is for renewal of leased space for Rosedale Center that houses a program um, for kids uh, from the grade six through 12. The leased space has been there for about five years. Board had originally approved it in 2016 for five years and this request is for extending that lease for next three years. Uh, we have worked with an independent agent to get the best cost for the lease, and the lease amount is uh, in the contract here, is four million, uh, five, eight, the new amount, modification amount is $1,100,000. Questions? questions? Looks like Ms. Causey has a question. Oh, Mr. McMillian, I apologize. Yes. Question, yes. Mr. Dixon, I'm hung up on the, the word temporary in that phrase because a lease has a, a time frame to begin with. So 
it, it's a little bit redundant to me. Can you explain that for me, please? Um, you are right. We can eliminate work temporary because the lease is for a period of three years. And after three years, uh, we may have lease or we may not have. We haven't determined the future of that lease after three years. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'll move on to the next one. Looks like Ms. Causey had a question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Dixit, so I was on the board when this original contract came through for a temporary yes. uh, home for our students at the Rosedale Alternative Center. Um, can you explain um, the circumstances and the arrangements of why those students were moved into this space to begin with? Briefly. Well, the old space did not meet the requirement, educational requirements. Um, so when we leased the building, we designed it, improved it to meet the educational requirements for that pro program. And in the meantime, while we moved kids to the new lease space, the old building was used to accommodate elementary schools that were under construction. So for first couple of years, we, we housed kids from Victory Villa Elementary Schools. Then the, for the next two years, we house kids from Colgate Elementary School. And for the next two years, it's going to be uh, accommodating kids for Red House Run Elementary Schools. So really, we got two wins here. We were able to use that old building as swing space, uh, saving or cost avoiding for construction for the new schools. And during that time, we provided a better space uh, for the Rosedale Center students. And how many students are in the Rosedale Alternative Center? The number fluctuates, but they have been in the range of 65 to 75 students, and they may fluctuate. And what were, what were the improvements in the educational um, environment from Rosedale Elementary School to this new space? So when new space was leased, even before leasing the space, we looked at the program, we worked with curriculum and instruction, and provided spaces that met the requirement of the program. The old building did not have at that time those spaces. So do they have a gym or an area for exercise? Yes, yes, they do. So it's a gym or... It's, it's a, I don't know the exact type of space, but it's a facility for athletic program. Okay. And so what is the annual per student cost to continue this? All that I have here is the least amount. I don't have per student cost, but if you take that total cost and divide that by 75 kids, and I can do that using my calculator if you want me to. The lease cost per year is about a million dollar, I believe, because the last contract was for $4.588 million for a period of uh, five years. So it comes to a little bit less. It comes to like 900,000, and that divide by 75, that's, that's the annual cost per student. Well, I would like our Rosedale alternative students to have all of the space and the appropriate space that they need. Um, they're students where uh, the staff is working very hard uh, to help them through situations um, to achieve uh, the highest academic um, outcomes that they can, um, but that seems like a very <laughs> expensive model. Well, I'm not sure about that because in order to prepare that space, we already put in there about a couple of million dollars that are included in the price of the original lease. So for next three years, we get a facility that has already been uh, fixed or, or constructed based on the requirement, and we don't pay for that because we have already paid in the last five years. So that statement uh, is not based on facts as I know it. So what was the in investment? So you're saying there's a sunk cost, is that correct? And so by the, the sunk cost already being there, 
the per annum is lower currently. That's that's true. Okay, so what was the sunk cost? The, the, I don't have all the, the details here, okay. but the numbers that I gave you, that $4.5 million for five years included the cost, which is uh, which included about $3 million in construction. So now we don't have to pay that additional amount in renewing the lease for three years. Okay, thank you. Okay. It looks like there's an, another question. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Dixit, from Mr. Kuhn. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, just so I'm clear, because I got a little confused with the 75 students and the million dollars. Um, didn't you say that this was also used for swing space for? No, the old facility where they were there. So the yeah. old Rosedale Center, students were moved from there to this new leased space. And the old building is being effectively utilized as swing space for construction of new elementary schools. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I yeah. thought that this space was being used for both no. the swing space and, and the 75 students, I believe you were talking about. Um, all right. And is this modification amount of $1.1 million, and that takes us for the next three years? $1 That's million dollars right. for the next three years? That's right. Okay, thanks. That makes the math a little better. Mr. Dixit, I just had one other question. So was there also a sunk cost in making improvements to Rosedale Elementary School to uh, bring it up to the program requirements for the elementary school students? There was some operating budget expenditure, um, uh, which is normal wear and tear of the building. The old Rosedale Center is an old, old building, and it does require maintenance costs to maintain it, but it was not a large amount of money. But it has air conditioning, correct? It was one of the... It it, the, it had window air conditioning units, which we left there. Uh, we did not install central air conditioning there. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next item 18. May I move to the next item, Madam Chair? Yes, please. So the next item 18 is JMI 613-17 which is, again, a consent to assignment. The name of the company is being changed from Hickory International to All Roads Kubota, and there is no additional funding needed there. Okay, and next you can go to 18. Um, excuse me, 19. Item 19 is CWA-109-21, and this is for pest management services. It's a new contract which is going to improve the quality of pest management, and the lowest bidder is at a cost of 875000 for five years. Thank you. If you could go to 20, please. Uh, 20 is contract CWA 110-21. It's a contract for snow removal that we only use when our in-house forces are not available. And it's a contract with a limit of $500,000 for five-year period. Thank you. If we could do 21. 21 is CWA-108-21, and this is one of the uh, roof replacement projects already approved by the board as part of the capital improvement program. Uh, the contract amount is $1,306,348 to Simpson of Maryland Incorporated, um, there were eight bidders, um, and it's good competition and prices within the budget. 
Thank you. If we could go to 22. 22 is ASI-801, 808-21, is for roof replacement at Hollabird Middle School. The school urgently needs this roof, and that's part of the reason we wanted this contract to be approved tonight. And as part of the board-approved capital improvement program, uh, the contract amount is 2522080 There were 11 bidders and uh, the price is uh, within the budget. Thank you. If we could go to 23. 23 is JME 517-21. It's for inward bus facility pavement uh, uh, overlay. Uh, it needs replacement. Uh, the cost is $189,420. The contractor is M.T. Laney Company. Thank you. And the last one, 2024 is mm -hmm. ASI 810-21. It's for the air conditioning unit replacement in the gym and locker room at Western Technology. Um, it's... Uh, the lowest bidder is $693,000. There were six bidders, good competition, and uh, your, your approval is requested. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like there's a motion in the chat from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'm going to ask board approval to co for contracts N16 to N24. I second it. Second. So the motion was uh, made... Uh, Oh, thank you for that. So the motion was made by Ms. Joes to approve contracts N16 through N24, and it was seconded, I believe, first by um, Mr. McMillian. And it um, uh, looks like there's a question from Ms. Causey to the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to uh, separate out number 16. Is that possible? So then you would, because the motion was made, then you would need to change the motion. Is is that correct, Mr. Mercedes? Miss uh, Miss Jose made a motion to approve contracts in sixteen through in twenty four. It was seconded by Mr. McMillian. Miss um, Causey would like to separate out in sixteen, but the motion has already been made. So would she then need to strike the um, add an amendment or something? Yes, it would be to amend the motion to uh, remove 16 from this motion, and 16 could be taken up afterwards. Okay, is that is that what you would like to do, Ms. Causey? Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Mr. Brusades. Um I would just like to make a motion to separate N16 from this motion and to have it be taken up after. Could you, could you put that motion in chat? Because um, I, yeah, just so that I said so I understand it, because it looks like you're wanting to separate out N16 from this motion, so you then would strike this N16 and you would change the motion by amending it. And then is your, are you wanting N16 to go to the 20th or are you wanting to con to process it further tonight. You wanted to go I'm to the gonna type, I'm going to type it in. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that'll be clear. Thank you. Ma Madam Chair, I, I believe I misspoke. This would not be in the nature of an amendment. It would be a, a motion to divide the question. Okay, so Ms. Calsey is asking, okay. So she's just removing N16. So it's dividing the question. So then N16 then would go to the 20th. No? It'll just be voted on next. Okay, it would just be voted on next. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I wrote and, in. And it's not debatable. Motion to divide the question with 16 as separate. Okay, Mr. Bercides, what's the appropriate way to process this? Would we then vote on the uh, motion made by Ms. Um, Joe's or once the question is divided, how are we 
processing uh, this. We would vote on the motion to divide by Ms. Causey. Okay, so we have to vote on the motion to divide um, with 16 as separate. I don't believe I said that correctly. Or was that correct? Oh, we don't need to vote on it. We, we so, um, so yes, you, need, need, you do need to vote on dividing the question, a majority vote. Okay. So we do need to vote on. Um, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, everyone, for, for hanging in there with us. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, Madam Chair, our, our past practice has been simply to divide upon requests of a member. Um, that has been the practice of the board. Obviously, the board can change its practice, uh, but it has not in the past been uh, something that we've subjected to vote. Okay, so then, so then that that's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out. So if we just divide upon requests, we remove 16. Then Miss Joseph's motion then is for in 17 um, through in 24. So then, would she then need to restate her motion or? No, ma'am, that's not necessary. You just vote on them separately. Vote on the division of the question. You vote on the question separately. So you would vote on every item except the one that was separated by Mrs. Causey. Okay. Um, I guess I'm asking that because Ms. Jost just put a motion in there to approve the contract. So we have to vote on Ms. Jost's motion. And that's Correct. approved contracts. With the exception of what Ms. Causey has asked be separated out. Okay. So then, then the motion now is that the board would, Ms. Jost's motion is to approve contracts in seven through N24, since N16 is separated out. That is correct. Okay. Okay, so then let me restate that. Um, my motion, excuse me, Ms. Joseph's motion um, would change to approve items N17 through N24, and it was seconded by Mr. McMillian. Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could take... Um, a roll call vote on that, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the motion passes. So N16 was separated out. Okay. And did we want to have further discussion? Were there any questions for N16, Ms. Causey? No, I'm just going to not vote on that item. Okay. Okay, so then it's a, um, do I have a motion uh, to approve item N16? So moved, Offerman. Is there a second? I'll second? Second, Molly. Thank you. It looks like it was motion to approve in 16 was made and seconded. If we could do a roll call vote, please, Ms. Um, Gover. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? I'm not voting on this. Abstain? Yes. Ms. Mack? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. So we've voted to move items to the next board meeting, and that is. Okay. Sorry, I'm just checking something.
Okay, so we still have R, S, and T. Uh, the next item on the agenda are information items, which include the Baltimore County Public Schools Official Efficiency Review, the Compass, our Pathway to Excellence Winter 2021 presentation and executive summary, revised 2021 school calendar, Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting, minutes of February 22nd, 2021, Superintendent's Rule 1600, Community Relations, Public Charter Schools, update on key legislation 2021. Next is agenda items. Um, the, the next item on the agenda is consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. Um, board members, please note that items provided at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. So if we could um, just go around the room. Um, Ms. Rowe? Yes, um, I'm concerned that there are multiple items that are being passed through the Office of Internal Audit Committee, and there hasn't been any communication about when those will appear on the general agenda. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, next is Ms. Causey. Um, I would like to see academic achievement added to the next board meeting, um, as well as other issues um, that I've already requested previously. Um, and I would also like to see on the agenda the plan for students coming into schools at four days a week. The staff had said they need three weeks for transportation, which didn't make sense to me because the table that's listed on the website indicates two weeks for parents to change the choices to in-person. Um, so I would have people go to the website and look at this table, parents that are interested um, in in-person um, because they have made improvements to the instructional model and the mitigation um, Procedures and protocols are working well, as we heard this evening. Um, <clears throat> because just because the board didn't vote to start on the 26th doesn't mean that uh, the staff can't be working on it. Because if they're not working on the plan and actually starting the plan by offering the option of four days to the parents, then if they come to the May, the, uh, the April 20th meeting, and then it takes three weeks from there, um, and then as the information item, the calendar, the revised calendar that's in the information, um, which I would have <clears throat> liked to discuss because it has to do with uh, moving the graduation dates up and it's unknown when, how long the seniors have to, seniors that may be struggling to, uh, to graduate, but in any case, so I'm 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 looking for a plan to be on the agenda at the next meeting. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Clausey, Ms. Smack, okay. um, Mr. McMillian. Yes, I'd like to uh, repeat what Ms. Rose said. There's two charters, and also the quarterly report of the internal audit that needs to get on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Next, Ms. Jose. Uh, no, nothing at this time, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Ms. Hen. Sure. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mahomza. I don't have an agenda. I'm going to just look forward to, um, to an update on graduation, uh, graduation and end of year activities for seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahumza. Mr. Offerman? No, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pastor? No, thank you. Thank you. And um, Mr. Kuhn, but I think he's... Oh, all right. Uh, Dr. Hager? Nothing to add. Thank you. And um, I don't have an agenda item to add, but I um, thank everybody for, for, their, for their time, and I appreciate hearing... Um, what agenda items um, board members would like to have for consideration. 
And uh, the next, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next hybrid meeting will be held on Tuesday, April 20th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned. Good night.